Thank you for listening to our audiobooks. We do our best to regularly upload quality books with clear narrations. Please subscribe to our channel and click the notification bell icon so we can bring you more great books. Thank you very much and enjoy your audiobook. To the rear of the gasping, panting column of men and urged us on from there. I was somewhere in the middle, jog-trotting laboriously with the rest and wondering how much longer I could keep going. And as my ribs heaved agonizingly and my leg muscles protested, I tried to work out just how many miles we'd run. I had suspected nothing when we lined up outside our billets. We weren't clad in PT kit, but in woolen pullovers and regulation slacks, and it seemed unlikely that anything violent was imminent. The corporal, too, a cheerful little cockney, appeared to regard us as his brothers. He had a kind face. All right, lads, he had cried, smiling over the fifty new airmen. We're just going to trot around to the park, so follow me. A leave, tune, out a double, quake, much, if right, if right, if right. That had been a long, long time ago, and we were still reeling through the London streets with never a sign of a park anywhere. The thought hammered in my brain that I had been under the impression that I was fit. A country vet, especially in the Yorkshire Dales, never had the chance to get out of condition. He was always on the move, wrestling with big animals, walking for miles between the fellside barns. He was hard and tough. That's what I thought. But now other reflections began to creep in. My few months of married life with Helen had been so much lotus-eating. She was too good a cook, and I was too faithful a disciple of her art. Just lounging by our bedsitter's fireside was the sweetest of all occupations. I had tried to ignore the disappearance of my abdominal muscles, the sagging of my petrels, but it was all coming home to me now. It's not far now, lads, the corporal chirped from the rear, but he struck no responsive chords in the toiling group. He had said it several times before, and we had stopped believing him. But this time it seemed he really meant it, because as we turned into yet another street, I could see iron railings and trees at the far end. The relief was inexpressible. I would just about have the strength to make it through the gates, to the rest and smoke which I badly needed because my legs were beginning to seize up. We passed under an arch of branches which still bore a few autumn leaves and stopped as one man, but the corporal was waving us on. Come on, lads, round the track, he shouted, and pointed to a broad earthen path which circled the park. We stared at him. He couldn't be serious. A storm of protest broke out. Ah, oh, no, corp. Have an art, corp. The smile vanished from the little man's face. Get moving, I said. Faster, faster, one, two, one, two. As I stumbled forward over the black earth between borders of sooty rhododendrons and tired grass, I just couldn't believe it. It was all too sudden. Three days ago, I was in Darby, and half of me was still back there, back with Helen. And another part was still looking out of the rear window of the taxi at the green hills receding behind the tiled roofs into the morning sunshine. Still standing in the corridor of the train as the flat terrain of southern England slid past and a great weight built up steadily in my chest. My first introduction to the RAF was at Lord's Cricket Ground. Masses of forms to fill, medicals, then the issue of an enormous pile of kit. I was billeted in a block of flats in St John's Wood, luxurious before the lush fittings had been removed. But they couldn't take away the heavy bathroom wear, and one of our blessings was the unlimited hot water gushing at our touch into the expensive surroundings. After that first crowded day, I retired to one of those green-tiled sanctuaries and lathered myself with a new bar of a famous toilet soap which Helen had put in my bag. I have never been able to use that soap since. Scents are too evocative, and the merest whiff jerks me back to that first night away from my wife and to the feeling I had then. It was a dull, empty ache which never really went away. On the second day, we marched endlessly. Lectures, meals, inoculations. I was used to syringes, but the very sight of them was too much for many of my friends, especially when the doctor took the blood samples. One look at the dark fluid flowing from their veins and the young men toppled quickly from their chairs, often four or five in a row, while the orderlies, grinning cheerfully, bore them away. We ate in the London Zoo, 
and our meals were made interesting by the chatter of monkeys and the roar of lions in the background. But in between, it was march, 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 with our new boots giving us hell. And on this third day, the whole thing was still a blur. We had been wakened, as on my first morning, by the hideous 6am clattering of dustbin lids. I hadn't really expected a bugle, but I found this noise intolerable. However, at the moment, my only concern was that we had completed the circuit of the park. The gates were only a few yards ahead, and I staggered up to them and halted among my groaning comrades. Round again, lads! the corporal yelled. And as we stared at him aghast, he smiled affectionately. You think this is tough? Wait till they get hold of you at ITW. I'm just kind of breaking you in gently. You'll thank me for this later, right at the double. One, two, one, two. Bitter thoughts assailed me as I lurched forward once more. Another round of the park would kill me. There was not a shadow of doubt about that. You left a loving wife and a happy home to serve king and country, and this was how they treated you. It wasn't fair. The night before, I had dreamt of Darabee. I was back in old Mr. Dakin's cow buyer. The farmer's patient eyes and the long, drooping, moustached face looked down at me from his stooping height. It looks as though it's all without blossom, then, he said, and rested his hand briefly on the old cow's back. It was an enormous, work-swollen hand. Mr. Dakin's gaunt frame carried little flesh, but the grossly thickened fingers bore testimony to a life of toil. I dried off the needle and dropped it into the metal box where I carried my suture materials, scalpels and blades. Well, it's up to you, of course, Mr. Dakin, but this is the third time I've had to stitch her teats and I'm afraid it's going to keep on happening. Aye, it's just the shape she is. The farmer bent and examined the row of knots along the four-inch scar. Bad girl, you wouldn't believe could make such a mess. Just another cow standing on it. A cow's hoof is sharp, I said. It's nearly like a knife coming down. That was the worst of very old cows. Their udders dropped, and their teats became larger and more pendulous, so that when they lay down in their stalls, the vital milk-producing organ was pushed away to one side, into the path of the neighbouring animals. If it wasn't Mabel on the right standing on it, it was Buttercup on the other side. There were only six cows in the little cobbled bar with its low roof and wooden partitions, and they all had names. You don't find cows with names anymore, and there aren't any farmers like Mr. Dakin, who somehow scratched the living from a herd of six milkers plus a few calves, pigs and hens. Aye, well, he said, I reckon Toud Lass doesn't owe me anything. I remember the night she was born, twelve years ago. She was out of our daisy, and I carried her out of this very byre on a sack, and this snow was coming down hard. Since then, I wouldn't like to count how many thousand gallons of milk she's turned out. She's still giving four a day. No, she doesn't owe me a thing. As if she knew she was the topic of conversation, Blossom turned her head and looked at him. She was the classical picture of an ancient bovine as fleshless as her owner, with jutting pelvic bones, splayed overgrown feet and horns with a multitude of rings along their curving length. Beneath her, the udder, once high and tight, drooped forlornly almost to the floor. She resembled her owner, too, in her quiet, patient demeanour. I had infiltrated her teeth with a local anaesthetic before stitching, but I don't think she would have moved if I hadn't used any. Stitting teats puts a vet in the ideal position to be kicked, with his head low down in front of the hind feet. But there was no danger with Blossom. She had never kicked anybody in her life. Mr. Dakin blew out his cheeks. Well, there's nought else for it. She'll have to go. I'll tell Jack Dodson to pick her up for the fat stock market on Thursday. She'll be a bit tough for eating, but I reckon she'll make a few steak pies. He was trying to joke, but he was unable to smile as he looked at the old cow. Behind him, beyond the open door, the green hillside ran down to the river, and the spring sunshine touched the broad sweep of the shallows with a million dancing lights. A beach of bleached stones gleamed bone-white against the long stretch of grassy bank, 
which rolled up to the pastures lining the valley floor. I had often felt that this small holding would be an ideal place to live, only a mile outside Darabee, but secluded and with this heart-lifting vista of river and fell. I remarked on this once to Mr. Dakin, and the old man turned to me with a wry smile. Aye, but the view's not very sustaining, he said. It happened that I was called back to the farm on the following Thursday to cleanse a cow, and was in the byre when Dodson, the drover, called to pick up Blossom. He had collected a group of fat bullocks and cows from other farms, and they stood watched by one of his men on the road high above. Now then, Mr. Dakin, he cried as he bustled in. It's easy to see which one you want me to take. It's that old screw over there. He pointed at Blossom, and in truth the unkind description seemed to fit the bony creature standing between her sleek neighbours. The farmer did not reply for a moment. Then he went up between the cows and gently rubbed Blossom's forehead. Aye, this is the one, Jack. He hesitated, then undid the chain round her neck. Off you go, out, lass, he murmured, and the old animal turned and made her way placidly from the stall. Ah, come on with you, shouted the dealer, poking his stick against the cow's rump. Don't hit her, barked Mr. Dakin. Dodson looked at him in surprise. I'd never hit him, you know that. Just uh, send him on like... I know, I know, Jack, but you won't need your stick for this, un. She'll go wherever you want. All that's done. Blossom confirmed his words as she ambled through the door, and, at a gesture from the farmer, turned along the track. The old man and I stood watching as the cow made her way unhurriedly up the hill, Jack Dodson in his long khaki smock sauntering behind her. As the path wound behind a clump of sparse trees, man and beast disappeared, but Mr. Dakin still gazed after them, listening to the clip-clop of the hooves on the hard ground. When the sound died away, he turned to me quickly. Right, Mr. Harriet, we'll get on with our job then. I'll bring your hot water. The farmer was silent as I soaked my arm and inserted it into the cow. If there is one thing more disagreeable than removing the bovine afterbirth, it is watching somebody else doing it, and I always try to maintain a conversation as I grope around inside. But this time, it was hard work. Mr. Dakin responded to my sallies on the weather, cricket, and the price of milk with a series of grunts. Holding the cow's tail, he leant on the hairy back and empty-eyed blew smoke from his pipe, which, like most farmers at a cleansing, he had prudently lit at the outset. And, of course, since the game was heavy, it just would happen that the job took much longer than usual. Sometimes a placenta simply lifted out. But I had this one away from the cotyledons one by one, returning every few minutes to the hot water and antiseptic to re-soap my aching arms. But at last it was finished. I pushed in a couple of pessaries, untied the sack from my middle, and pulled my shirt over my head. The conversation had died, and the silence was almost oppressive as we opened the bar door. Mr. Dakin paused, his hand on the latch. What's that? he said softly. From somewhere on the hillside I could hear the clip-clop of a cow's feet. There were two ways to the farm, and the sound came from a narrow track which joined the main road half a mile beyond the other entrance. As we listened, a cow rounded a rocky outcrop and came towards us. It was Blossom, moving in a brisk trot, great udder swinging, eyes fixed purposefully on the door open behind us. What the young man? Mr. Dakin burst out, but the old cow brushed past us and marched without hesitation into the stall which she'd occupied for all those years. She sniffed inquiringly at the empty hay rack and looked round at her owner. Mr. Dakin stared back at her. The eyes and the weathered face were expressionless, but the smoke rose from his pipe in a series of rapid puffs. Heavy boots clattered suddenly outside, and Jack Dodson panted his way through the door. Oh, there you are, you beggar, he gasped. I thought I'd lost you. He turned to the farmer. Bugger, I'm sorry, Mr. Jakin. She must have turned off at top of to the path. Oh, I never saw her go. The farmer shrugged. Oh, it's all right, Jack. It's not your fault. I should have told you. Well, that soon mended anyway. The drover grinned and moved towards Blossom. 
Come on, lass, let's have you out there again. But he halted as Mr Dakin held an arm in front of him. There was a long silence as Dodson and I looked in surprise at the farmer who continued to gaze fixedly at the cow. There was a pathetic dignity about the old animal as she stood there against the mouldering timber of the partition, her eyes patient and undemanding. It was a dignity which triumphed over the unsightliness of the long upturned hooves, the fleshless ribs, the broken down adder almost brushing the cobbles. Then, still without speaking, Mr. Dakin moved unhurriedly between the cows, and faint chink of metal sounded as he fastened the chain around Blossom's neck. Then he strolled to the end of the byre and returned with a forkful of hay, which he tossed expertly into the rack. This was what Blossom was waiting for. She jerked a mouthful from between the spars and began to chew with quiet satisfaction. What's to do, Mr. Dakin? the drover cried in bewilderment. They're waiting for me at Mart. The farmer tapped out his pipe on the half door and began to fill it with black shag from a battered tin. I'm sorry to waste your time, Jack, but you'll have to go without it. Without it? But, uh, ah, you'll think I'm daft, but that's how it is. Towd lass has come home, and she's stopping home. He directed a look of flat finality at the drover. Donson nodded a couple of times, then shuffled from the buyer. Mr. Dakin followed and called after him. I'll pay for your time, Jack. Put it on me bill. He returned, applied a match to his pipe, and drew deeply. Mr. Harriet, he said as the smoke rose around his ears, do you ever feel when somewhat happens that it was meant to happen, and that it was for best? Well, yes, I do, Mr. Dakin. I often feel that. Aye. Well, that's how I felt when Blossom came down that hill. He reached out and scratched the root of the cow's tail. She's always been a favourite. And by go, I'm glad she's back. But how about those teats? I'm willing to keep stitching them up, but... Nay, nee, lad. I've had an idea. Just came to me when you were taking away that cleansing, and I thought I was out late. An idea, aye. The old man nodded and tamped down the tobacco with his thumb. I can put two or three cows on her, instead of milking her. Well, the old stable is empty. She can live in there where there's nobody to stand on her out tits. I laughed. You're right, Mr. Dakin. She'd be safe in the stable, and she'd suckle three calves easily. She could pay her way. Well, as I said, it's matterless. After all them years, she doesn't owe me a thing. A gentle smile spread over the seamed face. Main thing is, she's come home. My eyes were shut most of the time now as I blundered round the park, and when I opened them a red mist swirled. But it is incredible what the human frame will stand, and I blinked in disbelief as the iron gates appeared once more under their arch of sooty branches. I had survived the second lap, but an ordinary rest would be inadequate now. This time I would have to lie down. I felt sick. Good lads, the corporal called out, cheerful as ever. You're doing fine. Now we're just going to have a little hopping on this spot. Incredulous wails rose from our demoralised band, but the corporal was unabashed. Feet together now, hop, hop, hop. Now that's no good. Come on, get some height into it. Hop, hop. This was the final absurdity. My chest was a flaming cavern of agony. These people were supposed to be making us fit, and instead they were doing irreparable damage to my heart and lungs. You'll thank me for this later, lads. Take my word for it. Get yourself off the ground. Up! Up! Through my pain I could see the corporal's laughing face. The man was clearly a sadist. It was no good appealing to him. And as, with the last of my strength, I launched myself into the air, it came to me suddenly why I had dreamt about Blossom last night. I wanted to go home too. Chapter 2 The fog swirled over the heads of the marching men. A London fog, thick, yellow, metallic on the tongue. I couldn't see the head of the column, only the swinging lantern carried by the leader. 
This 6.30 a.m. walk to breakfast was just about the worst part of the day, when my morale was low and thoughts of home rose painfully. We used to have fogs in Danaby, but they were country fogs, different from this. One morning I drove out on my rounds with the headlights blazing against the grey curtain ahead, seeing nothing from my tight shut box. But I was heading up the dale, climbing steadily with the engine pulling against the rising ground. Then, quite suddenly, the fog thinned to a shimmering silvery mist and was gone. And there above the pool, the sun was dazzling, and the long green line of the fells rose before me, thrusting exultantly into a sky of summer blue. Spellbound, I drove upwards into the bright splendour, staring through the windscreen as though I had never seen it all before, the bronze of the dead bracken spilling down the grassy flanks of the hills, the dark smudges of trees, the grey farmhouses and the endless pattern of walls creeping to the heather above. I was in a rush as usual, but I had to stop. I pulled up in a gateway. Sam jumped out and we went through into a field, and as the beagles scampered over the glittering turf, I stood in the warm sunshine, amid the melting frost, and looked back at the dark, damp blanket which blotted out the low country, but left this jewelled world above it. And, gulping the sweet air, I gazed about me gratefully at the clean, green land where I worked and made my living. I could have stayed there, wandering round, watching Sam exploring with waving tail, nosing into the shady corners where the sun had not reached, and the ground was iron hard, and the rime thick and crisp on the grass. But I had an appointment to keep, and no ordinary one. It was with a peer of the realm. Reluctantly, I got back into the car. I was due to start Lord Halton's tuberculin test at 9.30am, and as I drove round the back of the Elizabethan mansion to the farm buildings nearby, I felt a pang of misgiving. There were no animals in sight. There was only a man in tattered blue dungarees hammering busily at a makeshift crush at the exit to the fold yard. He turned round when he saw me and waved his hammer. As I approached, I looked wonderingly at the slight figure, with the soft, fairish hair falling over his brow, at the hold cardigan and muck-encrusted Wellingtons. You would have expected him to say... Now then, Mr. Harriet, I wasted this morning. But he didn't. He said, Harriet, my dear chap, I'm most frightfully sorry, but I'm very much afraid we're not quite ready for you. And he began to fumble with his tobacco pouch. William George Henry Augustus, 11th Marquis of Halton, always had a pipe in his mouth, and he was invariably either filling it, cleaning it out with a metal reaming tool, or trying to light it. I had never seen him actually smoking it and at times of stress he attempted to do everything at once. He was obviously embarrassed by his lack of preparedness, and when he saw me glance involuntarily at my watch, he grew more agitated, pulling his pipe from his mouth and putting it back in again, tucking the hammer under his arm, rummaging in a large box of matches. I gazed across to the rising ground beyond the farm buildings. Far off on the horizon I could make out tiny figures, galloping beasts, scurrying men, and faint sounds came down to me of barking dogs, irritated bellowings, and shrill cries of, Whoa! Whoa! Get her by! Sit down, dog! I sighed. It was the old story. Even the Yorkshire aristocracy seemed to share this carefree attitude to time. His lordship clearly sensed my feelings because his discomfort increased. Oh, it's too bad of me, old chap, he said spraying a few matchsticks around and dropping flakes of tobacco on the stone flags. I did promise to be ready for 9.30, but those blasted animals just won't cooperate. I managed a smile. Oh, never mind, Lord Halton. They seem to be getting them down the hill now, and I'm not in such a panic this morning anyhow. Splendid. Splendid! He attempted to ignite a towering mound of dark flake which spluttered feebly, then toppled over the edge of his pipe. And come and see this! I've been rigging up a crush. We'll dry them in here and we'll really have them. Remember we had a spot of bother last time, what? I nodded. I did remember. Lord Halton had only about thirty suckling cows, but it had taken a three-hour rodeo to test them. I looked doubtfully at the rickety structure of planks and corrugated iron. It would be interesting to see how it coped with the moorland cattle. I didn't mean to rub it in, but again I glanced unthinkingly at my watch, and the little man winced as though he had received a blow. Damn it! 
he burst out. What are they doing over there? I'll tell you what, I'll go and give them a hand. Distractedly, he began to change hammer, pouch, pipe and matches from hand to hand, dropping them and picking them up, before finally deciding to put the hammer down and stuff the rest into his pockets. He went off at a steady trot, and I thought, as I had done so often, that there couldn't be many noblemen in England like him. If I had been a Marquis, I felt, I would still have been in bed, or perhaps just parting the curtains and peering out to see what kind of day it was. But Lord Halton worked all the time, just about as hard as any of his men. One morning I arrived to find him at the supremely mundane task of plugging muck, standing on a manure heap, hurling steaming forkfuls onto a cart. And he always dressed in rags. I suppose he must have had more orthodox items in his wardrobe, but I never saw them. Even his tobacco was the great smoke of the ordinary farmer, red-breast flake. My musings were interrupted by the thunder of hooves and wild cries. The Halton herd was approaching. Within minutes the fold yard was filled with milling creatures, steam rising in rolling clouds from their bodies. The Marquis appeared round the corner of the buildings at a gallop. Right, Charlie, he yelled, let the first one into the crash. Panting with anticipation, he stood by the nailed boards as the men inside opened the yard gate. He didn't have to wait long. A shaggy red monster catapulted from the interior, appeared briefly in the narrow passage, then emerged at about fifty miles an hour from the other end with portions of his lordship's creation dangling from its horns and neck. The rest of the herd pounded close behind. Now stop them! Stop them! screamed the little peer, but it was of no avail. A hairy torrent flooded through the opening, and in no time at all the herd was legging it back to the highland in a wild stampede. The men followed them, and within a few moments Lord Halton and I were standing there just as before, watching the tiny figures on the skyline, listening to the distant, Oh, oh, get a bye! I say, he murmured despondently. Didn't work terribly well, did it? But he was made of stern stuff. Seizing his hammer, he began to bang away with undiminished enthusiasm, and by the time the beast returned, the crust was rebuilt, and a stout iron bar pushed across the front to prevent further breakouts. It seemed to solve the problem, because the first cow, confronted by the bar, stood quietly, and I was able to clip the hair on her neck through an opening between the planks. Lord Halton, in high good humour, settled down on an upturned oil drum with my testing book on his knee. "'I'll do the writing for you,' he cried. Far away, old chap. I poised my calipers. Eight, eight. He wrote it down, and the next cow came in. Eight, eight, I said, and he bowed his head again. The third cow arrived. Eight, eight. And the fourth. Eight, eight. His lordship looked up from the book and passed a weary hand across his forehead. Harriet, dear boy, can't you vary it a bit? I am beginning to lose interest. All went well until we saw the cow which had originally smashed the crush. She had sustained a slight scratch on her neck. I say, look at that, cried the peer. Will it be all right? Oh, yes, it's nothing. Superficial. Ah, good. But don't you think we should have something to put on it? Some of that... I waited for it. Lord Halton was a devotee of May and Baker's Propamidine Cream and used it for all minor cuts and grazes in his cattle. He loved the stuff. But unfortunately, he couldn't say propamidine. In fact, nobody on the entire establishment could say it except Charlie, the farm foreman, and he only thought he could say it. He called it propopamide, but his lordship had the utmost faith in him. Charlie, he bawled. Are you there, Charlie? The foreman appeared from the pack in the yard and touched his cap. Yes, my lord. Charlie, that wonderful stuff we get from Mr. Harry, you know, for cut teats and things. Pro, uh, pero, um, what the hell do you call it again? Charlie paused. It was one of his big moments. Propopamide, my lord. The Marquis, intensely gratified, slapped the knee of his dungarees. That's it, propopamide. Damned if I can get my tongue round it. <laughs> well done, Charlie. Charlie inclined his head modestly. The whole test was a vast improvement on last time, and we were finished within an hour and a half. There was just one tragedy. About halfway through, one of the cows dropped down dead with an attack of hypomagnesemia, a condition which often plagues sucklers. 
It was a sudden, painless collapse, and I had no chance to do anything. Lord Halton looked down at the animal, which had just stopped breathing. Do you think we could salvage it for meat if we bled her? Well, it's typical hypermag. Nothing to harm anybody. You could try. It'd depend on what the meat inspector says. The cow was bled, pulled into a van, and the peer drove off to the abattoir. He came back just as we were finishing the test. How did you get on? I asked him. Did they accept her? He hesitated. Uh, no. Uh, no, old chap, he said sadly. I'm afraid they didn't. Why? Did the meat inspector condemn the carcass? Well, I never got as far as the meat inspector, actually. Just saw one of the slaughtermen. And what did he say? Well, just two words, Harriet. Two words? Yes. Bugger off. I nodded. I see. It was easy to imagine the scene. The tough slaughterman viewing the small, unimpressive figure and deciding that he wasn't going to be put out of his routine by some ragged farm man. Well, never mind, sir, I said. You can only try. True. True, old chap. He dropped a few matches as he fumbled disconsolately with his smoking equipment. As I was getting into the car, I remembered about the propabadine. Uh, don't forget to call down for that cream, will you? By Jove, yes. I'll call down for it after lunch. I have great faith in that promi... Promi... Charlie, damn and blast, what is it? Charlie drew himself up proudly. Propopamide, me lad. Oh, yes, propopamide. The little man laughed, his good humour quite restored. Good lad, Charlie, you're a marvel. Thank you, me lad. The foreman wore the smug expression of the expert as he drove the cattle back into the field. It's a funny thing, but when you see a client about something, you very often see him again soon about something else. It was only a week later, with the district still in the iron grip of winter, that my bedside phone jangled me from slumber. After that first palpitation of the heart, which I feel does vets no good at all, I reached the sleepy hand from under the sheets. Uh, yes, I grunted. Harriet? I say, Harriet! Is that you, Harriet? The voice was laden with tension. Uh, yes, it is, Lord Halton. Oh, good, good. Dash it, I do apologise. Frightfully bad show, waking you up like this. I've got something damn peculiar here. A soft pattering followed, which I took to be matches falling around the receiver. Really? I yawned and my eyes closed involuntarily. Um, in what way exactly? Well, I've been sitting out with one of my best sows, been farrowing and produced twelve nice piglets, but there's something very odd. Well, how do you mean? Well, difficult to describe, old chap, but you know the, um, uh, bottom aperture? Well, there's a bloody great long red thing hanging from it. My eyes snapped open and my mouth gaped in a soundless scream. Prolapsed uterus. Hard labour in cows. A pleasant experience in ewes. Impossible in sows. Long red? When? How? I was stammering pointlessly. I didn't have to ask. Just popped it out, dear boy. I was waiting for another piglet, and whoops, there it was. Gave me a nasty turn. My toes curled tightly beneath the blankets. It was no good telling him that I had seen five prolapse uteri and pigs in my limited experience and had failed in every case. I had come to the conclusion that there was no way of putting them back. But I had to try. I'll be right out, I muttered. I looked at the alarm clock. It was 5.30. A horrible time, truncating the night slumber, yet eliminating any chance of a soothing return to bed for an hour before the day's work. And I hated turning out even more since my marriage. Helen was lovely to come back to, but by the same token it was a bigger rent to leave her warm, soft presence and venture into the inhospitable world outside. And the journey to the Halton farm was not enlivened by my memories of those five other sows. I had tried everything. Full anaesthesia, lifting them upside down with pulleys, directing a jet from a hose on the averted organ, and all the time pushing, straining, sweating over the great mass of flesh which refused to go back through that absurdly small hole. The result in each case had been the conversion of my patient into pork pies and a drastic plummeting of my self-esteem. There was no moon and the soft glow from the piggery door made the only light among the black outlines of the buildings. Lord Halton was waiting at the entrance, and I thought I'd better warn him. 
I have to tell you, sir, that this is a very serious condition. It's only fair that you should know that the sow very often has to be slaughtered. The little man's eyes widened, and the corners of his mouth drooped. Oh, I say, that's rather a bore. One of my best animals. I, I'm rather attached to that pig. He was wearing a polo neck sweater of such advanced dilapidation that the hem hung in long woolen fronds almost to his knees, and as he tremblingly attempted to light his pipe, he looked very vulnerable. I'll do my very best, I added hastily. There is always a chance. Oh, good man. In his relief, he dropped his pouch, and as he stooped, the open box of matches spilled around his feet. It was some time before he retrieved them and went into the piggery. The reality was as bad as my imaginings. Under the single weak electric bulb of the pen, an unbelievable length of very solid-looking red tissue stretched from the rear end of a massive white sow lying immobile on her side. The twelve pink piglets fought and worried along the row of teats. They didn't seem to be getting much. As I stripped off and dipped my arms into the steaming bucket, I wished with all my heart that the poor sign uterus was a little short thing and not this horrible, awkward shape. And it was a disquieting thought that tonight I had no artificial aids. People used all sorts of tricks and various types of equipment, but here in this silent building there was just the pig, Lord Halton, and me. His lordship, I knew, was willing and eager, but he had helped me at jobs before, and his usefulness was impaired by the fact that his hands were always filled with his smoking items, and he kept dropping things. I got down on my knees behind the animal with the feeling that I was on my own. And as soon as I cradled the mass in my arms, the conviction flooded through me that this was going to be the same as all the others. The very idea of this lot going back whence it came was ridiculous, and the impression was reinforced as I began to push. Nothing happened. I had sedated the sow heavily, and she wasn't straining much against me. It was just that the thing was so huge. By supreme effort, I managed to feed a few inches back into the vaginal opening, but as soon as I relaxed, it popped quietly out again. My strongest instinct was to call the whole thing off without delay. The end result would be the same, and anyway, I wasn't feeling very strong. In fact, my whole being was permeated by the leaden-armed, pervading weakness one feels when forced to work in the small hours. I would try just once more. Lying flat, my naked chest against the cold concrete, I fought with the thing till my eyes popped and my breath gave out, but it had not the slightest effect, and it made my mind up. I had to tell him. Rolling over on my back, I looked up at him, panting, waiting till I had the wind to speak. I would say, Lord Halton, we are really wasting our time here. This is an impossible case. I am going back home now, and I'll ring the slaughterhouse first thing in the morning. The prospect of escape was beguiling. I might even be able to crawl in beside Helen for an hour. But as my mouth framed the words, the little man looked down at me appealingly, as though he knew what I was going to say. He tried to smile, but darted anxious glances at me, at the pig, and back again. From the other end of the animal, a soft, uncomplaining grunt reminded me that I wasn't the only one involved. I didn't say anything. I turned back onto my chest, braced my feet against the wall of the pen, and began again. I don't know how long I was there, pushing, relaxing, pushing again as I gasped and groaned and the sweat ran steadily down my back. The peer was silent, but I knew he was following my progress intently, because every now and then I had to brush matches from the surface of the uterus. Then, for no particular reason, the heap of flesh in my arms felt suddenly smaller. I glared desperately at the thing. There was no doubt about it. It was only half the size. I had to take a breather, and a hoarse croak escaped me. God, I think it's going back. I must have startled Lord Halton in mid-fill, because I heard a stifled, What? What? Oh, I say, how absolutely splendid! And a fragrant shower of tobacco cascaded from above. This was it, then. Summoning the last of my energy in one big effort, I blew half an ounce or so of red-breast flake from the uterine mucosa and heaved forward. And, miraculously, there was little resistance, and I stared in disbelief as the great organ disappeared gloriously and wonderfully from sight. 
I was right behind it with my arm, probing frantically away to the shoulder as I rotated my wrist again and again till both uterine cornua were fully involuted. When I was certain, beyond doubt, that everything was back in place, I lay there for a few moments, my arm still deep inside the sow, my forehead resting on the floor. Dimly, through the mist of exhaustion, I heard Lord Halton's cries. Stout fella! Dash it, how marvellous! Oh, stout fella! He was almost dancing with joy. One last terror assailed me. What if it came out again? Quickly I seized needle and thread and began to insert a few sutures in the vulva. Here, hold this, I barked, giving him the scissors. Stitching with the help of Lord Halton wasn't easy. I kept pushing needle or scissors into his hands, then demanding them back peremptorily, and it caused a certain amount of panic. Twice he passed me his pipe to cut the ends of my suture, and on one occasion I found myself trying in the dim light to thread the silk through his reaming tool. His lordship suffered too in his turn because I heard the occasional stifled oath as he impaled a finger on the needle. But at last it was done. I rose wearily to my feet and leant against the wall, my mouth hanging open, sweat trickling into my eyes. The little man's eyes were full of concern as they roved over my limply hanging arms and the caked blood and filth on my chest. Harriet, my dear chap, you're all in. And you'll catch pneumonia or something if you stand around half naked. You need a hot drink. Look, tell you what, get yourself cleaned up and dressed and I'll run down to the house for something. He scurried swiftly away. My aching muscles were slow to obey as I soaped and toweled myself and pulled on my shirt. Fastening my watch round my wrist, I saw that it was after seven and I could hear the farm men clattering in the yard outside as they began their morning tasks. I was buttoning my jacket when the little peer returned. He bore a tray with a pint mug of steaming coffee and two thick slices of bread and honey. He placed it on a bale of straw and pulled up an upturned bucket as a chair before hopping onto a meal bin where he sat like a pixie on a toadstool with his arms around his knees, regarding me with keen anticipation. The servants are still a bed, old chap, he said, so I made this little bite for you myself. I sank onto the bucket and took a long pull at the coffee. It was black and scalding with a kick like a Galloway bullock and it spread like fire through my tired frame. Then I bit into the first slice of bread, homemade, plastered thickly with farm butter and topped by a lavish layer of heather honey from the long row of hives I had often seen on the edge of the moor above. I closed my eyes in reverence as I chewed. Then as I reached for the pint pot again, I looked up at the small figure on the bin. Uh, may I say, sir, that this isn't a bite. <laughs> it's a feast. It is all absolutely delicious. His face lit up with impish glee. Well, dash it. Do you really think so? Well, I'm so pleased. And you've done nobly, dear boy. Can't tell you how grateful I am. As I continued to eat ecstatically, feeling the strength ebbing back, he glanced uneasily into the pen. Uh, Harriet, those stitches. Don't like the look of them much. Oh, yes, I said. Uh, they're just a precaution. You can nick them out in a couple of days. Splendid. But uh, won't they leave a wound? We'd better put something on them. I paused in mid-chew. Here it was again. He only needed his papamidine to complete his happiness. Yes, old chap. We must apply some of that prip... Prom... Oh, hell and blast! It's no good! He threw back his head and bellowed. Charlie! The foreman appeared in the entrance, touching his cap. Morning, my lad. Morning, Charlie. See that this sow gets some of that wonderful cream on, eh? What the blazes do you call it again? Charlie swallowed and squared his shoulders. Propopper mind, my lad. The little man threw his arms high in delight. Of course, of course! Propopper mind! I wonder if I'll ever be able to get that word out. He looked admiringly at his foreman. Charlie, you never fail. Don't know how you do it. Charlie bowed gravely in acknowledgement. Lord Halton turned to me. You'll let us have some more, Papa Mind, won't you, Harriet? Certainly, I replied. I think I have some in the car. Sitting there on the bucket amid the mixed aromas of pig and barley meal and coffee, 
I could almost feel the waves of pleasure beating on me. His lordship was clearly enchanted by the whole business. Charlie was wearing the superior smile which always accompanied his demonstrations of lingual dexterity, and as for myself, I was experiencing a mounting euphoria. I could see into the pen, and the sight was rewarding. The little pigs, who had been sheltered in a large box during the operation, were back with their mother, side by side in a long pink row, as their tiny mouths enclosed the teats. The sow seemed to be letting her milk down, too, because there was no frantic scramble for position, just a rapt concentration. She was a fine pedigree pig, and instead of lying on the butcher's slab, today she would be starting to bring up her family. As though reading my thoughts, she gave a series of contented grunts, and the old feeling began to bubble in me, the deep sense of fulfilment and satisfaction that comes from even the smallest triumph and makes our lives worthwhile. And there was something else. A new thought stealing into my consciousness, with a delicious, fresh tingle about it. At this moment, who else in the length and breadth of Britain was eating a breakfast personally prepared and served by a Marquis? Chapter 3 I am afraid of dentists. I am particularly afraid of strange dentists. So, before I went into the RAF, I made sure my teeth were in order. Everybody told me that they were very strict about the air crew's teeth, and I didn't want some unknown prodding around in my mouth. There had to be no holes anywhere, or the teeth would start to ache away up there in the sky. So they said. So, before my call-up, I went to see old Mr. Grover in Darby, and he painstakingly did all that was necessary. He was good at his job, and was always gentle and careful, and didn't strike the same terror into me as other dentists. All I felt when I went to his surgery was a dryness of the throat, and a quivering at the knees, and, providing I kept my eyes tightly shut all the time, I managed to get through the visit fairly easily. My fear of dentists dates back to my earliest experiences in the twenties. As a child, I was taken to the dread Hector McDarrach in Glasgow, and he did my dental work right up to my teens. Friends of my youth tell me that he inspired a similar lasting fear in them too, and in fact there must be a whole generation of Glaswegians who feel the same. Of course, you couldn't blame Hector entirely. The equipment in those days was primitive, and a visit to any dental practice was an ordeal. But Hector, with his booming laugh, was so large and overpowering that he made it worse. Actually, he was a very nice man, cheerful and good-natured, but the other side of him blotted it all out. The electric drill had not yet been invented, or if it had, it hadn't reached Scotland, and Hector bored holes in teeth with a fearsome foot-operated machine. There was a great wheel driven by a leather belt, and this powered the drill, and as you lay in the chair, two things dominated the outlook, the wheel whirring by your ear, and Hector's huge knee pistoning almost into your face as he pedalled furiously. He came from the far north, and at the Highland Games he used to array himself in kilt and sporran and throw cabers around like matchsticks. He was so big and strong that I always felt hopelessly trapped in that chair, with his bulk over me, and the wheel grinding, and the pedal thumping. He didn't exactly put his foot on my chest, but he had me all right. And it didn't worry him when he got into the sensitive parts with his drill. My strangled cries were of no avail, and he carried on remorselessly to the end. I had the impression that Hector thought it was sissy to feel pain, and maybe he was of the opinion that suffering was good for the soul. Anyway, since those early days, I've had a marked preference for small, frail, soft-spoken dentists, like Mr. Grover. I like to feel that if it came to a stand-up fight, I would have a good chance of victory and escape. Also, Mr. Grover understood that people were afraid, and that helped. I remember him chuckling when he told me about the big farm men who came to have their teeth extracted. Many a time, he said, he had gone across the room for his instruments and turned back to find the chair empty. I still don't enjoy going to the dentist, but I have to admit that the modern men are wonderful. I hardly see mine when I go. 
just a brief glimpse of a white coat, then all is done from behind. Fingers come round, things go in and out of my mouth, but even when I venture to open my eyes, I see nothing. Hector McDarrock, on the other hand, seemed to take a pleasure in showing off his grisly implements, filling the long-needled syringe right in front of my eyes and squirting the cocaine ceiling words a few times before he started on me. And worse, before an extraction, he used to clank about in a tin box, producing a series of hideous forceps and examining them, whistling softly, till he found the right one. So, with all this in mind, as I sat in a long queue of airmen for the preliminary examination, I was thankful I had been to Mr. Grover for a complete check-up. A dentist stood by a chair at the end of the long room, and he examined the young men in blue one by one before calling out his findings to an orderly at a desk. I derived considerable entertainment from watching the expressions on the lads' faces when the call went out. Uh, three fillings, two extractions, eight fillings. Most of them looked stunned, some thunderstruck, others almost tearful. Now and again one would try to expostulate with the man in white, but he was no good. Nobody was listening. At times I could have laughed out loud. Mind you, I felt a bit mean at being amused, but after all, they had only themselves to blame. If only they had shown my foresight, they would have had nothing to worry about. When my name was called, I strolled across, humming a little tune, and dropped nonchalantly into the chair. It didn't take the man long. He poked his way swiftly along my teeth, then rapped out, Five fillings and one extraction. I sat bolt upright and stared at him in amazement. But, but... I began to yammer. I had a check-up by my own. Next, please, murmured the dentist. But Mr. Grover said, Next man, move along, bawled the orderly. And as I shuffled away, I gazed appealingly at the white-coated figure. But he was reciting a list of my premolars and incisors and showed no interest. I was still trembling when I was handed the details of my fate. Report at Regent Lodge tomorrow morning for the extraction, the WAF girl said. Tomorrow morning? By God, they didn't mess about. And what the heck did it all mean, anyway? My teeth were perfectly sound. There was only that one with a bit of enamel chipped off. Mr. Grover had pointed it out and said he wouldn't give any trouble. It was the tooth that held my pipe. Surely it couldn't be that one. But there came the disquieting thought that my opinion didn't matter. When my feeble protests were ignored back there, it hit me for the first time that I wasn't a civilian any more. Next morning, the din from the dustbin lids had hardly subsided when the grim realisation drove into my brain. I was going to have a tooth out today, and very soon, too. I passed the intervening hours in growing apprehension. Morning parade, the march through the darkness to breakfast. The dried egg and fried bread were less attractive than ever, and the grey day had hardly got under way before I was approaching the forbidding façade of Regent Lodge. As I climbed the steps, my palms began to sweat. I didn't like having my teeth drilled, but extractions were infinitely worse. Something in me recoiled from the idea of having a part of myself torn away by force, even if it didn't hurt. But of course, I told myself as I walked along an echoing corridor, it never did hurt nowadays. Just a little prick, then nothing. I was nurturing this comforting thought when I turned into a large assembly room with numbered doors leading from it. About thirty airmen sat around wearing a variety of expressions from sickly smiles to tough bravado. A chilling smell of antiseptic hung on the air. I chose a chair and settled down to wait. I had been in the armed services long enough to know that you waited a long time for everything, and I saw no reason why a dental appointment should be any different. As I sat down, the man on my left gave me a brief nod. He was fat, and greasy black hair fell over his pimpled brow. Though engrossed in picking his teeth with a match, he gave me a long, appraising stare before addressing me in rich cockney. What room are you going in, mate? I looked at my card. Um, at room four. Blimey, mate, you've had it. He removed his matchstick and grinned wolfishly. Had it? What do you mean? Well, haven't you heard? That's the butcher in here. The, uh, the, uh, butcher? I quavered. Yeah, that's what they call a dental officer in here. He gave an expansive smile. He's a right killer, that bloke, I tell you. 
I swallowed. Butcher? Killer? Oh, come on. They'll all be the same, I'm sure. Don't you believe it, mate. There's good and there's bad, and that bloke's pure murder. Shouldn't be allowed. Well, how do you know, anyway? He waved an airy hand. Oh, I've been here a few times, and I've heard some bleeding awful screams coming out of that room. Spoken to some of the chaps afterwards, too. They all call him a butcher. I rubbed my hands on the rough blue of my trousers. Ah, oh, well, you hear these tales? I'm sure they're exaggerated. Well, you'll find out, mate. He resumed his toothpicking. But don't say I didn't tell you. He went on about various things, but I only half heard him. His name, it seemed, was Simkin. And he was not an air crew cadet like the rest of us, but a regular and a member of the ground staff. He worked in the kitchens. He spoke scornfully of us raw recruits and pointed out that we would have to get some service in before we were fit to associate with the real members of the Royal Air Force. I noticed, however, that despite his own years of allegiance, he was still an AC2 like myself. Almost an hour passed with my heart thumping every time the door of number four opened. I had to admit that the young men leaving that room all looked a bit shattered and one almost reeled out holding his mouth with both hands. Cure! Look at that poor bugger! Simpkin drawled with ill-concealed satisfaction. Strike me. He's been through it, poor bleeder. I'm glad I'm not in your shoes, mate. I could feel the tension mounting in me. What room are you going to, anyway? I asked. He did a bit of deep exploration with his match. Uh, room two, mate. Been in here before. He's a grand bloke, one of the best. Never hurt you. Well, you're lucky, aren't you? Not lucky, mate. He paused and stabbed his match at me. I know my way around, that's all. There's ways and means. He allowed one eyelid to drop briefly. The conversation was abruptly terminated as the dread door opened and Waff came out. AC2 Harriet, she called. I got up on shaking limbs and took a deep breath. As I set off, I had a fleeting glimpse of the leer of pure delight on Simpkin's face. He was really enjoying himself. As I passed the portals, my feelings of doom increased. The butcher was another Hector McDarrock, about six foot two with rugby forward shoulders bulging his white coat. My flesh crept as he unleashed a hearty laugh and motioned me towards the chair. As I sat down, I decided to have one last try. Is this the tooth? I asked, tapping the only possible suspect. It is indeed, boomed the butcher. That's the one. Ah, well, I said with a light laugh. I'm sure I can explain. There's been some mistake. Yes, yes, he murmured, filling the syringe before my eyes and sending a few playful spurts into the air. There's just a bit of enamel off it, and Mr. Grover said... The waff suddenly wound the chair back, and I found myself in the semi-prone position with the white bulk looming over me. You see, I gasped desperately, I need that tooth. It's the one that holds my... A strong finger was on my gum, and I felt the needle going in. I resigned myself to my fate. When he had inserted the local, the big man put the syringe down. We'll just give that a minute or two, he said, and left the room. As soon as the door closed behind him, the waff tiptoed over to me. This fellow's loopy, she whispered. Half lying, I stared at her. Loopy? What do you mean? Crackers, round the bend. No idea how to pull teeth. But, but, he's a dentist, isn't he? She pulled a wry face. Thinks he is, but he hasn't a clue. I had no time to explore this cheering information further because the door opened and the big man returned. He seized a horrible pair of forceps and I closed my eyes as he started flexing his muscles. I must admit, I felt nothing. I knew he was twisting and tugging away up there, but the local had mercifully done its job. I was telling myself that it would soon be over when I heard a sharp crack. I opened my eyes. The butcher was gazing disappointedly at my broken-off tooth in his forceps. The root was still in my gum. Behind him, the waff gave me a long, I told you so, look. She was a pretty little thing, but I fear the libido of the young men she encountered in here would be at a low ebb. Oh, 
the butcher grunted and began to rummage in a metal box. It took me right to the McDurrock days as he fished out one forceps after another, opened and shut them a few times, then tried them on me. But he was of no avail, and as the time passed, I was the unwilling witness of the gradual transition from heartiness to silence, then to something like panic. The man was clearly whacked. He had no idea how to shift that route. He must have been gouging for half an hour when an idea seemed to strike him. Pushing all the forceps to one side, he almost ran from the room and reappeared shortly with a tray on which reposed a long chisel and a metal mallet. At a sign from him, the waff wound the chair back till I was completely horizontal. Seemingly familiar with the routine, she cradled my head in her arms in a practised manner and stood waiting. This couldn't be true, I thought, as the man inserted the chisel into my mouth and poised the mallet. But all doubts were erased as the metal rod thudded against the remnants of my tooth and my head in turn shot back into the little waff's bosom. And that was how it went on. I lost count of the times the butcher banged away and the girl hung on grimly to my jerking skull. The thought uppermost in my mind was that I had always wondered how young horses felt when I knocked wolf teeth out of them. Now, I knew. When it finally stopped, I opened my eyes, and though by this time I was prepared for anything, I still felt slightly surprised to see the butcher threading a needle with a length of suture silk. He was sweating, and looking just a little desperate, as he bent over yet again. Uh, just a couple of stitches, he muttered hoarsely, and I closed my eyes again. When I left the chair, I felt very strange indeed. The assault on my cranium had made me dizzy, and the sensation of the long ends of the stitches tickling my tongue was distinctly odd. I was sure that when I came out of the room I was staggering, and instinctively I pawed at my mouth. The first man I saw was Simkin. He was where I had left him, but he looked different as he beckoned excitedly to me. I went over and he caught at my tunic with one hand. What do you think, mate? he gasped. They've chased me round, and I've got to go into room four. He gulped. You look bloody awful coming out here. What was it like? I looked at him. Maybe there was going to be a gleam of light this morning. I sank into the chair next to him and groaned. My God, you weren't kidding. I'd never met anybody like that. He's half killed me. They don't call him the butcher for nothing. Why? What if... What did he do? Well, nothing much. Just knocked my tooth out with a hammer and chisel, that's all. Gah, me on! Simkin made a ghastly attempt to smile. Word of honour, I said. Anyway, there's the tray coming out now. Look for yourself. He stared at the waff carrying the dreadful implements and turned very pale. Oh, blimey! Well, what else did he do? I held my jaw for a moment. Well, he did something I've never seen before. He made such a great hole in my gum that he had to stitch me up afterwards. Simkin shook his head violently. Nah, I'm not having that. I don't believe you. All right, I said. What do you think of this? I leant forward, put my thumb under my lip and jerked it up to give him a close-up view of the long gash and the trailing blood-stained ends of the stitches. He shrank away from me, lips trembling, eyes wide. God, he moaned. Oh, God. It was unfortunate that the waff chose that particular moment to call out, AC2 Simkin, piercingly from the doorway, because the poor fellow leapt as though a powerful electric current had passed through him. Then, head down, he trailed across the room. At the door, he turned and gave me a last despairing look, and I saw him no more. This experience deepened my dread of the five fillings which awaited me. But I needn't have worried. They were trivial things and were efficiently and painlessly dealt with by RAF dentists very different from the butcher. And yet, many years after the war had ended, the man from room four stretched out a long arm from the past and touched me on the shoulder. I began to feel something sharp coming through the roof of my mouth and went to Mr. Grover, who x-rayed me and showed me a pretty picture of that fateful root still there despite the hammer and chisel. He extracted it, and the saga was ended. The butcher 
remained a vivid memory, because, apart from my ordeal, I was constantly reminded of him by the dangerous wobbling of my pipe at the edge of that needless gap in my mouth. But I did have a small solace. I finished my visit to room four with a parting shaft which gave me a little comfort. As I tottered away, I paused and addressed the big man's back as he prepared for his next victim. By the way, I said, I knocked out a lot of teeth just like you did there. He turned and stared at me. Really? Are you a dentist? No, I replied over my shoulder as I left. I'm a vet. Chapter 4 I like women better than men. Mind you, I have nothing against men. After all, I am one myself. But in the RAF, there were too many of them. Literally thousands. Jostling, shouting, swearing. You couldn't get away from them. Some of them became my friends and have remained so until the present day, but the sheer earthy mass of them made me realise how my few months of married life had changed me. Women are gentler, softer, cleaner, altogether nicer things, and I, who always considered myself one of the boys, had come to the surprising conclusion that the companion I wanted most was a woman. My impression that I had been hurled into a coarser world was heightened at the beginning of each day, particularly one morning when I was on fire picket duty and had the sadistic pleasure of rattling the dustbin lids and shouting, Wakey, wakey! along the corridors. It wasn't the cursing and the obscene remarks which struck deepest. It was the extraordinary abdominal noises issuing from the dark rooms. They reminded me of my patient Cedric, and in an instant I was back in Darrowby answering the telephone. The voice at the other end was oddly hesitant. Uh, Mr. Harriet, I should be grateful if you would come and see my dog. It was a woman, obviously upper class. Well, certainly. What's the trouble? Well, he, um, he seems to suffer from <clears throat> a certain amount of flatus. I beg your pardon? There was a long pause. He has excessive flatus. In what way, exactly? Well, I suppose you'd describe it as, um, windiness. The voice had begun to tremble. I thought I could see a gleam of light. Uh, you mean his stomach? No, not his stomach. He, um, passes a, a considerable quantity of wind from his, his... A note of desperation had crept in. Ah, yes! All became suddenly clear. I quite understand. But that doesn't sound very serious. Is he ill? No, he's, um, very fit in other ways. Well, then, do you think it's necessary for me to see him? Oh, yes, indeed, Mr. Harriet. I wish you would come as soon as possible. It has become quite... quite a problem. All right, I said. I'll look in this morning. Can I have your name and address, please? It's Mrs. Rumney. The Laurels. The Laurels was a very nice house on the edge of the town, standing back from the road in a large garden. Mrs. Rumney herself let me in and I felt a shock of surprise at my first sight of her. It wasn't just that she was strikingly beautiful, but there was an unworldly air about her. She would be around forty, but had the appearance of a heroine in a Victorian novel, tall, willowy, ethereal. And I could understand immediately her hesitation on the phone. Everything about her suggested fastidiousness and delicacy. Cedric is in the kitchen, she said. I'll take you through. I had another surprise when I saw Cedric. An enormous boxer hurled himself on me in delight, clawing at my chest with the biggest, horniest feet I had seen for a long time. I tried to fight him off, but he kept at me, panting ecstatically into my face and wagging his entire rear end. Sit down, boy, the lady said sharply. Then, as Cedric took absolutely no notice, she turned to me nervously. He's so friendly. Yes, I said breathlessly. I can see that. I finally managed to push the huge animal away and backed into a corner for safety. 
How often does this um, excessive fetus occur? As if in reply, an almost palpable sulphurous wave arose from the dog and eddied around me. It appeared that the excitement of seeing me had activated Cedric's weakness. I was up against the wall and unable to obey my first instinct to run for cover, so I held my hand over my face for a few moments before speaking. Is, um, that what you meant? Mrs. Romney waved the lace handkerchief under her nose, and the faintest flush crept into the pallor of her cheeks. Yes, she replied almost inaudibly. Yes, that is it. Oh, well, I said briskly, there's nothing to worry about. Let's go into the other room and we'll have a word about his diet and a few other things. It turned out that Cedric was getting rather a lot of meat, and I drew up a little chart cutting down the protein and adding extra carbohydrates. I prescribed a kaolin antacid mixture to be given night and morning and left the house in a confident frame of mind. It was one of those trivial things and I had entirely forgotten it when Mrs. Romney phoned again. I'm afraid... Cedric is no better, Mr. Harriet. Oh, well, I'm sorry to hear that. He's still, um, st still, yes. Yes. I spent a few moments in thought. I, I tell you what, I don't think I can do any more by seeing him at the moment, but I think you should cut out his meat completely for a week or two, uh, keep him on biscuits and brown bread rusked in the oven. Try him with that and vegetables, and I'll give you some powder to mix in his food. Perhaps you'd call round for it. The powder was a pretty strong, absorbent mixture, and I felt sure it would do the trick, but a week later Mrs. Romney was on the phone again. There's absolutely no improvement, Mr. Harriet. The tremble was back in her voice. I... I do wish you'd come and see him again. I couldn't see much point in viewing this perfectly healthy animal again, but I promised to call. I had a busy day, and it was after six o'clock before I got round to the laurels. There were several cars in the drive, and when I went into the house, I saw that Mrs. Romney had a few people in for drinks. People like herself, upper class and of obvious refinement. In fact, I felt rather a lout in my working clothes among the elegant gathering. Mrs. Romney was about to lead me through to the kitchen when the door burst open and Cedric bounded delightedly into the midst of the company. Within seconds, an aesthetic-looking gentleman was frantically beating off the attack as the great feet ripped down his waistcoat. He got away at the cost of a couple of buttons, and the boxer turned his attention to one of the ladies. She was in imminent danger of losing her dress when I pulled the dog off her. Pandemonium broke out in the graceful room. The hostess's plaintive appeals rang out above the cries of alarm as the big dog charged around, but very soon I realised that a more insidious element had crept into the situation. The atmosphere in the room became rapidly charged with an unmistakable effluvium and it was clear that Cedric's unfortunate malady had reasserted itself. I did my best to shepherd the animal out of the room, but he didn't seem to know the meaning of obedience, and I chased him in vain. And as the embarrassing minutes ticked away, I began to realise for the first time the enormity of the problem which confronted Mrs. Romney. Most dogs break wind occasionally, but Cedric was different. He did it all the time. And while his silent emanations were perhaps more treacherous, there was no doubt that the audible ones were painfully distressing in a company like this. Cedric made it worse, because at each rasping expulsion he would look round inquiringly at his back end, then gamble about the room as though the fugitive Zephyr was clearly visible to him and he was determined to corner it. It seemed a year before I got him out of there. Mrs. Romney held the door wide as I finally managed to steer him towards it, but the big dog wasn't finished yet. On his way out, he cocked a leg swiftly and directed a powerful jet against an immaculate trouser leg. After that night, I threw myself into the struggle on Mrs. Romney's behalf. I felt she desperately needed my help, and I made frequent visits and tried innumerable remedies. I consulted my colleague Siegfried on the problem, and he suggested a diet of charcoal biscuits. Cedric ate them in vast quantities and with evident enjoyment, but they, like everything else, made not the slightest difference to his condition. And all the time I pondered about the enigma of Mrs. Romney. She had lived in Darby for several years, but the townsfolk knew little about her. It was a matter of debate whether she was a widow or separated from her husband, but I was not interested in such things. The biggest mystery to me was how she ever got involved with a dog like Cedric.
It was difficult to think of any animal less suited to her personality. Apart from his regrettable affliction, he was in every way the opposite to herself. A great, thick-headed, rumbustious extrovert, totally out of place in her gracious menage. I never did find out how they came together, but on my visits I found that Cedric had one admirer at least. He was Con Fenton, a retired farm worker who did a bit of jobbing gardening and spent an average of three days a week at the laurels. The boxer romped down the drive after me as I was leaving, and the old man looked at him with undisguised admiration. Bad girl, he said. He's a fine dog, is that? Yes, he is, Con. He's a good chap, really. And I meant it. You couldn't help liking Cedric when you got to know him. He was utterly amiable and without vice, and he gave off a constant aura not merely of noxious vapours, but of bonhomie. When he tore off people's buttons or sprinkled their trousers, he did it in a spirit of the purest amity. Just look at them limbs, breathed Con, staring rapturously at the dog's muscular thighs. By heck, he can jump out of that gate as if it weren't there. He's what I call a dog. As he spoke, it struck me that Cedric would be likely to appeal to him because he was very like the boxer himself, not overburdened with brains, built like an ox, with powerful shoulders, and a big, constantly grinning face. They were two of a kind. Ah, uh, he always likes it when Mrs. lets him out in the garden, Con went on. He always spoke in a peculiar, snuffling manner. He's grand company. I looked at him narrowly. No, he wouldn't be likely to notice Cedric's complaint since he always saw him out of doors. On my way back to the surgery, I brooded on the fact that I was achieving absolutely nothing with my treatment. And though it seemed ridiculous to worry about a case like this, there was no doubt the thing had begun to prey on my mind. In fact, I began to transmit my anxieties to Siegfried. As I got out of the car, he was coming down the steps of Scaledale House, and he put a hand on my arm. You've been to the laurels, James? Tell me, he inquired solicitously. How's your farting boxer today? Still at it, I'm afraid, I replied, and my colleague shook his head in commiseration. We were both defeated. Maybe if chlorophyll tablets had been available in those days, they might have helped, but as it was, I had tried everything. It seemed certain that nothing would alter the situation, and it wouldn't have been so bad if the owner had been anybody else but Mrs. Rumney. I found that even discussing the thing with her had become almost unbearable. Siegfried's student brother Tristan didn't help either. When seeing practice, he was very selective in the cases he wished to observe, but he was immediately attracted to Cedric's symptoms and insisted on coming with me on one occasion. I never took him again because as we went in, the big dog bounded from his mistress' side and produced a particularly sonorous blast as if in greeting. Tristan immediately threw out a hand in a dramatic gesture and declaimed, Speak on, sweet lips, that never told a lie. That was his only visit. I had enough trouble without that. I didn't know it at the time, but a greater blow awaited me. A few days later, Mrs. Romney was on the phone again. Mr. Harriet, a friend of mine, has such a sweet little boxer bitch, she wants to bring her along to be mated with Cedric. Eh? She wants to mate her bitch with my dog. With Cedric? I clutched at the edge of the desk. It couldn't be true. And, um, <coughs> are you agreeable? Well, yes, of course. I shook my head to dispel the feeling of unreality. I found it incomprehensible that anyone should want to reproduce Cedric, and as I gaped into the receiver, a frightening vision floated before me of eight little Cedrics all with his complaint. But, of course, such a thing wasn't hereditary. I took a grip of myself and cleared my throat. Very well, then, Mrs. Rumney, you'd better go ahead. There was a pause. But, Mr. Harriet, I want you to supervise the mating. Oh, really, I don't think that's necessary. I dug my nails into my palm. I think you'll be all right without me. Oh, but I would be much happier if you were there. Please come, she said, appealingly. Instead of emitting a long-drawn groan, I took a deep breath. Right, I said. I'll be along in the morning. All that evening I was obsessed by a feeling of dread. Another acutely embarrassing session was in store with this exquisite woman. Why was it I always had to share things like this with her? And I really feared the worst. 
Even the daftest dog, when confronted with a bitch in heat, knows instinctively how to proceed, but with a really ivory-skulled animal like Cedric, I wondered. And next morning, all my fears were realised. The bitch, Trudy, was a trim little creature, and showed every sign of willingness to cooperate. Cedric, on the other hand, though obviously delighted to meet her, gave no hint of doing his part. After sniffing her over, he danced around her a few times, goofy-faced, tongue lolling. Then he had a roll on the lawn before charging at her and coming to a full stop. Big feet outsplayed, head down, ready to play. I sighed. It was as I thought. The big chump didn't know what to do. This pantomime went on for some time, and inevitably the emotional strain brought on a resurgence of his symptoms. Frequently he paused to inspect his tail as though he had never heard noises like that before. He varied his dancing routine with occasional headlong gallops round the lawn, and it was after he had done about ten successive laps that he seemed to decide he ought to do something about the bitch. I held my breath as he approached her, but unfortunately he chose the wrong end to commence operations. Trudy had put up with his nonsense with great patience, but when she found him busily working away in the region of her left ear, it was too much. With a shrill yelp, she nipped him in the hind leg, and he shot away in alarm. After that, whenever he came near, she warned him off with bared teeth. Clearly, she was disenchanted with her bridegroom, and I couldn't blame her. I think she's had enough, Mrs. Rumney, I said. I certainly had had enough, and so had the poor lady, judging by her slight breathlessness, flushed cheeks and waving handkerchief. Yes, yes, I suppose you're right, she replied. So Trudy was taken home, and that was the end of Cedric's career as a stud dog. This last episode decided me. I had to have a talk with Mrs. Rumney, and a few days later I called in at the Laurels. Maybe you'll think it's none of my business, I said, but I honestly don't think Cedric is the dog for you. In fact, he's so wrong for you that he's upsetting your life. Mrs. Rumney's eyes widened. Well, he is a problem in some ways, but... What do you suggest? I think you should get another dog in his place. Maybe a poodle or a corgi. Something smaller. Something you could control. But, Mr. Harriet, I couldn't possibly have Cedric put down. Her eyes filled quickly with tears. I really am fond of him, despite... despite everything. No, 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 of course not, I said. I like him too. He has no malice in him. But I think I have a good idea. Why not let Con Fenton have him? Con? Yes. He admires Cedric tremendously, and the big fellow would have a good life with the old man. He has a couple of fields behind his cottage and keeps a few bees. Cedric could run to his heart's content out there, and Con would be able to bring him along when he does the garden. You'd still see him three times a week. Mrs. Rumney looked at me in silence for a few moments, and I saw in her face the dawning of relief and hope. You know, Mr. Harriet... I think that could work very well. But are you sure Con would take him? I'd like to bet on it. An old bachelor like him must be lonely. There's only one thing worries me. Normally they only meet outside, and I wonder how it would be when they were indoors and Cedric started to, um, when the old trouble... Oh, I think that would be all right. Mrs Rumney broke in quickly. When I go on holiday, Con always takes him for a week or two, and he has never mentioned any, um, <coughs> anything unusual. In that way? I got up to go. Well, that's fine. I should put it to the old man right away. Mrs Rumney rang within a few days. Con had jumped at the chance of taking Cedric, and the pair had apparently settled in happily together. She had also taken my advice and acquired a poodle puppy. I didn't see the new dog till it was nearly six months old, and his mistress asked me to call to treat it for a slight attack of eczema. As I sat in the graceful room looking at Mrs. Rumney, cool, poised, tranquil, with the little white creature resting on her knee, I couldn't help feeling how right and fitting the whole scene was. The lush carpet, the trailing velvet curtains, the fragile tables with their load of expensive china and framed miniatures. It was no place for Cedric. Confenton's cottage was less than half a mile away, and on my way back to the surgery, on an impulse, I pulled up at the door. The old man answered my knock, and his face split into a delighted grin when he saw me. Come in, young man, he cried in his strange, snuffly voice. I'm right glad to see that. 
I had hardly stepped into the tiny living room when a hairy form hurled itself upon me. Cedric hadn't changed a bit, and I had to battle my way to the broken armchair by the far side. Con settled down opposite, and when the boxer leapt to lick his face, he clumped him companionably on the head with his fist. Sit down, you great duff bugger, he murmured with affection. Cedric sank happily onto the tattered hearthrug at his feet and gazed up adoringly at his new master. Well, was there it? Con went on as he cut up some villainous-looking plug tobacco and began to stuff it into his pipe. I'm right grateful to you for getting with this grand dog. Vagor, he's a chopper, and I wouldn't sell him for any money. No man could ask for a better friend. Well, that's great, Con, I said. And I can see that the big chap is really happy here. The old man ignited his pipe and a cloud of acrid smoke rose to the low, blackened beams. Aye, he's hardly ever inside. A great, strong dog like him wants to work his energy off like. But just at that moment, Cedric was obviously working something else off because the familiar pungency rose from him even above the billowings from the pipe. Con seemed oblivious of it, but in the enclosed space I found it overpowering. Ah, oh, well, <coughs> I gasped. I just looked in for a moment to see how you were getting on together. I must be on my way. I rose hurriedly and stumbled towards the door, but the redolence followed me in a wave as I passed the table with the remains of the old man's meal, and I saw what seemed to be the only form of ornament in the cottage, a cracked vase holding a magnificent bouquet of carnations. It was a way of escape, and I bedded my nose in their fragrance. Con watched me approvingly. Ah, they're lovely flowers, aren't they? Mrs. at Laurel lets me bring home what I want, and I reckon them carnations is me favourite. Yes. They're a credit to you. I still kept my nose among the blooms. There's only one thing, the old man said pensively. I don't get full benefit of them. Now, oh, how's that, Con? He pulled at his pipe a couple of times. Well, you can hear I speak a bit funny-like. No, no. Not really. I, I, I know I do, I do. I've been like it since I were a lad. I had operation for adenoids and some of it wrong. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that, I said. Well, it's not serious, but it's left me um, lacking in one way. You mean... A light was beginning to dawn in my mind. An elucidation of how man and dog had found each other. Of why their relationship was so perfect of the certainty of their happy future together. It seemed like fate. Aye, the old man went on sadly. I have no sense of smell. Chapter 5 I think it was when I saw the London policeman wagging a finger at a scowling urchin that I thought of Wesley Binks and the time he put the fireworks through the surgery letterbox. It was what they used to call a banger, and it exploded at my feet as I hurried along the dark passage in answer to the doorbell's ring, making me leap into the air in terror. I threw open the front door and looked into the street. It was empty. But at the corner where the lamplight was reflected in Robson's shop window, I had a brief impression of a fleeing form and a faint echo of laughter. I couldn't do anything about it, but I knew Wes was out there somewhere. Wearily, I trailed back into the house. Why did this lad persecute me? What could a ten-year-old boy possibly have against me? I'd never done him any harm, yet I seemed to be the object of a deliberate campaign. Or maybe it wasn't personal. It could be that he felt I represented authority or the establishment in some way, or perhaps I was just convenient. I was certainly the ideal subject for his little tricks of ringing the doorbell and running away because I dared not ignore the summons in case he might be a client. And also the consulting and operating rooms were such a long way from the front of the house. Sometimes I was dragged down from our bedsitter under the tiles. Every trip to the door was an expedition. And it was acutely exasperating to arrive there and see only a little figure in the distance dancing about and grimacing at me. He varied this routine by pushing rubbish through the letterbox, pulling the flowers from the tiny strip of garden we tried to cultivate between the flagstones, and chalking rude messages on my car. I knew I wasn't the only victim because I had heard complaints from others. 
the fruiterer who saw his apples disappear from the box in front of the shop, the grocer who unwillingly supplied him with free biscuits. He was the town naughty boy all right, and it was incongruous that he should have been named Wesley. There was not the slightest sign in his behaviour of any strict Methodist upbringing. In fact, I knew nothing of his family life, only that he came from the poorest part of the town, a row of yards containing tumble-down cottages, some of them evacuated because of their condition. I often saw him wandering about in the fields and lanes, or fishing in quiet reaches of the river when he should have been in school. When he spotted me on these occasions, he invariably called out some mocking remark, and if he happened to be with some of his cronies, they all joined in the laughter at my expense. It was annoying, but I used to tell myself that there was nothing personal in it. I was an adult, and that was enough to make me a target. Wes's greatest triumph was undoubtedly the time he removed the grating from the coal cellar outside Skeldale House. It was on the left of the front steps, and underneath it was a steep ramp down which the coalmen tipped their bags. I don't know whether it was inspired intuition, but he pinched the grating on the day of the Darabi Gala. The festivities started with a parade through the town led by the Hulton Silver Band, and as I looked down from the windows of our bed-sitter, I could see them all gathering in the street below. Look, Helen, I said. They must be starting the march from Trengate. Everybody I know seems to be down there. Helen leant over my shoulder and gazed at the long lines of boy scouts, girl guides, ex-servicemen, with half the population of the town packed on the pavements watching. Yes, quite a sight, isn't it? Let's go down and see them off. We trotted down the long flights of stairs and I followed her out through the front door. And as I appeared in the entrance, I was suddenly conscious that I was the centre of attention. The citizens on the pavement, waiting patiently for the parade to start, had something else to look at now. The little brownies and wolf cubs waved at me from their ranks, and there were nods and smiles from the people across the road and on all sides. I could divine their thoughts. That's young Wittenry coming out of his house, not long married to. That's his missus next to him. A feeling of well-being rose in me. I don't know whether other newly married men feel the same, but in those early days I was aware of a calm satisfaction and fulfilment. And I was proud to be the Wittenry and part of the life of the town. There was my plate on the wall beside me, a symbol of my solid importance. I was a man of substance now. I had arrived. Looking around me, I acknowledged the greeting with a few dignified little smiles, raising a gracious hand now and then rather like a royal personage on view. Then I noticed that Helen hadn't much room by my side, so I stepped to the left to where the grating should have been and slid gracefully down into the cellar. It would be a dramatic touch to say I disappeared from view. In fact, I wish I had, because I would have stayed down there and avoided further embarrassment. But as it was, I travelled down only so far down the ramp and stuck there with my head and shoulders protruding into the street. My little exhibition caused a sensation among the spectators. Nothing in the gala parade could compete with this. One or two of the surrounding faces expressed alarm, but loud laughter was the general response. The adults were almost holding each other up, but the little brownies and wolf cubs made my most appreciative audience, breaking their ranks and staggering about helplessly in the roadway while their leaders tried to restore order. I caused chaos too in the Hulton Silver Band, who were hoisting their instruments prior to marching off. If they had any ideas about bursting into tune, they had to abandon them temporarily, because I don't think any of them had breath to blow. It was, in fact, two of the bandsmen who extricated me by linking their hands under my armpits. My wife was of no service at all in the crisis, and I could only look up at her reproachfully as she leant against the doorpost, dabbing at her eyes. It all became clear to me when I reached street level. I was flicking the coal dust from my trousers and trying to look unconcerned when I saw Wesley Binks doubled up with mirth pointing triumphantly at me and at the hole over the cellar. He was quite near, jostling among the spectators, and I had my first close look at the wild-eyed little goblin who had played me. I may have made an unconscious movement towards him because he gave me a last malevolent grin and disappeared into the crowd. Later I asked Helen about him. She could only tell me that Wesley's father had left home when he was about six years old, that his mother had remarried and the boy now lived with her and his stepfather. 
Strangely, I had another opportunity to study him quite soon afterwards. It was about a week later, and my feathers were still a little ruffled after the grating incident, when I saw him sitting all alone in the waiting room, alone that is, except for a skinny black dog in his lap. I could hardly believe it. I had often rehearsed the choice phrases which I would use on this very occasion, but the sight of the animal restrained me. If he had come to consult me professionally, I could hardly start pitching into him right away. Maybe later. I pulled on a white coat and went in. Well, what can I do for you? I asked coldly. The boy stood up, and his expression of mixed defiance and desperation showed that it had cost him something to enter this house. Somewhat matter with me dog? He muttered. Right. Bring him through. I led the way along the passage to the consulting room. Put him on the table, please, I said. And as he lifted the little animal, I decided that I couldn't let this opportunity pass. While I was carrying out my examination, I would quite casually discuss recent events. Nothing nasty, no clever phrases, just a quiet probe into the situation. I was just about to say something like, what's the idea of all those tricks you play on me, when I took my first look at the dog, and everything else fled from my mind. He wasn't much more than a big puppy, and an out-and-out -out mongrel. His shiny black coat could have come from a Labrador, and there was a suggestion of terrier in the pointed nose and pricked ears, but the long string-like tail and the knock-kneed forelimbs baffled me. For all that, he was an attractive little creature with a sweetly expressive face. But the things that seized my whole attention were the yellow blobs of pus in the corners of the eyes and the mucopurulent discharge from the nostrils and the photophobia which made the dog blink painfully at the light from the surgery window. Classical canine distemper is so easy to diagnose, but there is never any satisfaction in doing so. I didn't know you had a dog, I said. How long have you had him? A month. Fella got him from dog and cat home in Artington and sold him to me. I see. I took the temperature and was not surprised to find it was 104. How old is he? Nine months. I nodded. Just about the worst age. I went ahead and asked all the usual questions, but I knew the answers already. Yes, the dog had been slightly off colour for a week or two. No, he wasn't really ill, but listless and coughing occasionally. And, of course, it was not until the eyes and nose began to discharge that the boy became worried and brought him to see me. That was when we usually saw these cases, when it was too late. Wesley imparted the information defensively, looking at me under lowered brows, as though he expected me to clip his ear at any moment. But as I studied him, any aggressive feelings I may have harboured evaporated quickly. The imp of hell appeared on closer examination to be a neglected child. His elbows stuck out through holes in a filthy jersey. His shorts were similarly ragged. But what appalled me most was the dour smell of his unwashed little body. I hadn't thought that there were children like this in Darabee. When he had answered my questions, he made an effort and blurted out one of his own. What's the matter with him? I hesitated a moment. He's got distemper, Wes. What's that? Well, it's a nasty infectious disease. He must have got it from another sick dog. Will he get better? I hope so. I'll do the best I can for him. I couldn't bring myself to tell a small boy of his age that his pet was probably going to die. I filled the syringe with a mixed macturin, which were used at that time against the secondary invaders of distemper. It never did much good. But even now, with all our antibiotics, we cannot greatly influence the final outcome. If you can catch a case in the early viral phase, then a shot of hyperimmune serum is curative, but people rarely bring their dogs in until that phase is over. As I gave the injection, the dog whimpered a little, and the boy stretched out a hand and patted him. It's all right, Duke, he said. That's what you call him, is it? Duke? Aye. He fondled the ears, and the dog turned, whipped his strange long tail about and licked the hand quickly. Wes smiled and looked up at me, and for a moment the tough mask dropped from the grubby features and the wild, dark eyes I read, sheer delight. I swore under my breath. 
this made it worse. I tipped some boracic crystals into a box and handed it over. Use this dissolved in water to keep his eyes and nose clean. See how his nostrils are all caked and blocked up? You can make him a lot more comfortable. He took the box without speaking, and almost with the same movement dropped three and sixpence on the table. It was about our average charge and resolved my doubts on that score. When will I bring him back? he asked. I looked at him doubtfully for a moment. All I could do was repeat the injections, but was it going to make the slightest difference? The boy misread my hesitation. I can pay, he burst out. I can get money. Oh, no, I didn't mean that, Wes. I was just wondering when it would be suitable. Um, how about bringing him in on Thursday? He nodded eagerly and left with his dog. As I swabbed the table with this infectant, I had the old feeling of helplessness. The modern veterinary surgeon does not see nearly as many cases of distemper as we used to, simply because most people immunise their puppies at the earliest possible moment. But back in the 30s, it was only the fortunate dogs who were inoculated. The disease is so easy to prevent, but almost impossible to cure. The next three weeks saw an incredible change in Wesley Bink's character. He had built up a reputation as an idle scamp, but now he was transformed into a model of industry, delivering papers in the mornings, digging people's gardens, helping to drive the beasts at the auction mart. I was perhaps the only one who knew he was doing it for Duke. He brought the dog in every two or three days and paid on the nail. I naturally charged him as little as possible, but the money he earned went on other things. Fresh meat from the butcher, extra milk and biscuits. Duke's looking very smart today, I said in one of the visits. I see you've even got him a new collar and lead. The boy nodded shyly, then looked up at me, dark eyes intent. Is he any better? Well, he's about the same. That's how it goes, dragging on without much change. When? When will you know? I thought for a moment. Maybe he would worry less if he understood the situation. The thing is this. Duke will get better if he can avoid the nervous complications of distemper. What's them? Fits, paralysis, and a thing called chorea, which makes the muscles twitch. What if he gets them? It's a bad lookout in that case, but not all dogs develop them. I tried to smile reassuringly. And there's one thing in Duke's favour. He's not a purebred. Crossbred dogs have a thing called hybrid vigour, which helps them to fight disease. After all, he's eating fairly well, and he's quite lively, isn't he? Aye, not bad. Well, then, we'll carry on. I'll give him another shot now. The boy was back in three days, and I knew by his face he had momentous news. Duke's a lot better. His eyes and nose have dried up, and he's eaten like an oss. He was panting with excitement. I lifted the dog onto the table. There was no doubt he was enormously improved, and I did my best to join in the rejoicing. That's great, Wes, I said, but a warning bell was tinkling in my mind. If nervous symptoms were going to supervene, this was the time, just when the dog was apparently recovering. I forced myself to be optimistic. Well, now, there's no need to come back any more, but watch him carefully, and if you see anything unusual, bring him in. The ragged little figure was overjoyed. He almost pranced along the passage with his pet and I hoped fervently that I would not see him in there again. That was on the Friday evening, and by Monday I had put the whole thing out of my head and into the category of satisfying memories when the boy came in with Duke on the lead. I looked up from the desk where I was writing in the day book. What is it, Wes? He's dothering. I didn't bother going through to the consulting room, but hastened from behind the desk and crouched on the floor, studying the dog intently. At first, I saw nothing. Then, as I watched, I could just discern a faint nodding of the head. I placed my hand on the top of the skull and waited. And it was there. The slight but regular twitching of the temporal muscles which I had dreaded. I'm afraid he's got career, Wes, I said. What's that? It's one of the things I was telling you about. Sometimes they call it St. Vitus Dance. I was hoping it wouldn't happen. The boy looked suddenly small and forlorn, and he stood there silent, twisting the new leather lead between his fingers. 
It was such an effort for him to speak that he almost closed his eyes. Will he die? Some dogs do get over it, Wes. I didn't tell him that I had seen it happen only once. I've got some tablets which might help him. I'll get you some. I gave him a few of the arsenical tablets I had used in my only cure. I didn't even know if they had been responsible. But I had nothing more to offer. Duke's career pursued a textbook course over the next two weeks. All the things I had feared turned up in a relentless progression. The twitching spread from his head to his limbs, then his hindquarters began to sway as he walked. His young master brought him in repeatedly and I went through the motions, trying at the same time to make it clear that it was all hopeless. The boy persisted doggedly, rushing about meanwhile with his paper deliveries and other jobs, insisting on paying though I didn't want his money. Then one afternoon he called in. I couldn't bring Duke, he muttered. He can't walk now. Will you come and see him? We got into my car. It was Sunday about three o'clock and the streets were quiet. He led me up the cobbled yard and opened the door of one of the houses. The stink of the place hit me as I went in. Country vets aren't easily sickened, but I felt my stomach turning. Mrs. Binks was very fat and a filthy dress hung shapelessly on her as she slumped cigarette in mouth over the kitchen table. She was absorbed in a magazine which lay in a clearing among mounds of dirty dishes, and her curlers nodded as she looked up briefly at us. On the couch under the window, her husband sprawled asleep, open-mouthed, snoring out the reek of beer. The sink, which held a further supply of greasy dishes, was covered in a revolting green scum. Clothes, newspapers and nameless rubbish littered the floor, and over everything a radio blasted away at full strength. The only clean new thing was the dog basket in the corner. I went across and bent over the little animal. Duke was now prostrate and helpless, his body emaciated and jerking uncontrollably. The sunken eyes had filled up again with pus and gazed apathetically ahead. Wes, I said, you've got to let me put him to sleep. He didn't answer, and as I tried to explain, the blaring radio drowned my words. I looked over at his mother. Do you mind turning the radio down? I asked. She jerked her head at the boy, and he went over and turned the knob. In the ensuing silence, I spoke to him again. It's the only thing, believe me. You can't let him die by inches like this. He didn't look at me. All his attention was fixed desperately on his dog. Then he raised a hand, and I heard his whisper. All right. I hurried out to the car for the Nambutil. I promise you he'll feel no pain, I said as I filled the syringe. And indeed, the little creature merely sighed before lying motionless, the fateful twitching stilled at last. I put the syringe in my pocket. Do you want me to take him away, Wes? He looked at me bewilderedly, and his mother broke in. Aye, aye, get him out. I never wanted the bloody thing here in the first place. She resumed her reading. I quickly lifted the little body and went out. Wes followed me and watched as I opened the boot and laid Duke gently on top of my black working coat. As I closed the lid, he screwed his knuckles into his eyes and his body shook. I put my arm across his shoulders, and as he leant against me for a moment and sobbed, I wondered if he had ever been able to cry like this, like a little boy with somebody to comfort him. But soon he stood back and smeared the tears across the dirt on his cheeks. Are you going back into the house, Wes? I asked. He blinked and looked at me with a return of his tough expression. Yeah, he said, and turned and walked away. He didn't look back, and I watched him cross the road, climb a wall, and trail away across the fields towards the river. And it has always seemed to me that at that moment Wes walked back into his old life. From then on, there were no more odd jobs or useful activities. He never played any more tricks on me, but in other ways he progressed into more serious misdemeanours. He set barns on fire, was up before the magistrate for theft, and by the time he was thirteen he was stealing cars. 
Finally, he was sent to an approved school, and then he disappeared from the district. Nobody knew where he went, and most people forgot him. One person who didn't was the police sergeant. That young Wesley Binks, he said to me ruminatively. He was a wrong if ever I saw one. You know, I don't think he ever cared a damn for anybody or any living thing in his life. I know how you feel, Sergeant, I replied. But you're not entirely right. There was one living thing. Chapter 6 Tristan would never have won any prizes as an experiment of the haute cuisine. We got better food in the REF than most people in wartime Britain, but it didn't compare with the Darabi fair. I suppose I had been spoiled first by Mrs. Hall, then by Helen. There were only brief occasions at Skeldale House when we did not eat like kings, and one of those was when Tristan was installed as temporary cook. It began one morning at breakfast in the days when I was still a bachelor, and Tristan and I were taking our places at the mahogany dining table. Siegfried bustled in, muttered a greeting, and began to pour his coffee. He was unusually distray as he buttered a slice of toast and cut into one of the rashers on his plate. Then, after a minute's thoughtful chewing, he brought down his hand on the table with a suddenness that made me jump. I've got it! he exclaimed. Got what? I inquired. Siegfried put down his knife and fork and wagged a finger at me. Silly, really? I've been sitting here puzzling about what to do, and it's suddenly clear. Why? What's the trouble? It's Mrs. Hall, he said. She just told me her sister has been taken ill and she has to go and look after her. She thinks she'll be away for a week and I've been wondering who I could get to look after the house. I see. Then he struck me. He sliced the corner from a fried egg. Tristan can do it. Eh? His brother looked up startled from his daily mirror. Me? Yes, you. You spend a lot of time on your ass. Bit of useful activity would be good for you. Tristan looked at him warily. What do you mean, useful activity? Well... Keeping the place straight, Siegfried said. I wouldn't expect perfection, but you could tidy up each day and, of course, prepare the meals. Meals? That's right. Siegfried gave him a level stare. You can cook, can't you? Well, uh, yes. I can cook sausage and mash. Siegfried waved an expansive hand. Hey, I see. No problem. Push over those fried tomatoes, will you, James? I passed the dish silently. I had only half heard the conversation because part of my mind was far away. Just before breakfast, I'd had a phone call from Ken Billings, one of our best farmers, and his words were still echoing in my head. Mr. Harriet, that calf you saw yesterday is dead. That's the third one I've lost in a week, and I'm flummoxed. I want you out here this morning to have another look round. I sipped my coffee absently. He wasn't the only one who was flummoxed. Three fine calves had shown symptoms of acute gastric pain. I had treated them, and they had died. That was bad enough, but what made it worse was that I hadn't the faintest idea what was wrong with them. I wiped my lips and got up quickly. Siegfried, I'd like to go to Billings first, then I've got the rest of the rounds you gave me. Fine, James, yeah, by all means. My boss gave me a sweet and encouraging smile, balancing a mushroom on the piece of fried bread, and conveyed it to his mouth. He wasn't a big eater, but he did love his breakfast. On the way to the farm, my mind beat about helplessly. What more could I do than I had already done? In these obscure cases, one was driven to the conclusion that the animal had eaten something harmful. At times, I spent hours roaming around pastures looking for poisonous plants, but that was pointless with Billings cows because they had never been out. They were mere babies of a month old. I had carried out post-mortem examinations of the dead animals, but had found only a non-specific gastroenteritis. I had sent kidneys to the laboratory for lead examination with negative results. Like their owner, I was flummoxed. Mr Billings was waiting for me in his yard. Good job I rang you, he said breathlessly. There's another one starting. I rushed with him into the buildings and found what I expected. And dreaded. A small calf kicking at its stomach, getting up and down, occasionally rolling on its straw bed. Typical abdominal pain. But why? I went over it as with the others. Temperature normal, lungs clear, only ruminal atony and extreme tenderness as I palpated the abdomen. 
As I was putting the thermometer back in its case, the calf suddenly toppled over and went into a frothing convulsion. Hastily I injected sedatives, calcium, magnesium, but with a feeling of doom. I had done it all before. What the hell is it? the farmer asked, voicing my thoughts. I shrugged. It's acute gastritis, Mr Billings, but I wish I knew the cause. I could swear this calf has eaten some irritant or corrosive poison. Well, dang it, they've no but had milk and a few nuts. The farmer spread his hands. There's nothing they can get to hurt him. Again, wearily, I went through the old routine, ferreting around in the calf pen, trying to find some clue. An old paint tin, a burst packet of sheet dip. It was amazing the things you came across in the clutter of the farm building. But not at Mr Billings' place. He was meticulously tidy, particularly with his calves, and the window sills and shelves were free from rubbish. It was the same with the milk buckets, scoured to spotless cleanliness after every feed. Mr Billings had a thing about his calves. His two teenage sons were fanatically keen on farming, and he encouraged them in all the agricultural skills. But he fed the calves himself. Feeding them calves is the most important job in stock rearing, he used to say. Get them over that first month and you're halfway there. And he knew what he was talking about. His charges never suffered from the normal ailments of the young. No scar, no joint ill, no pneumonia. I had often marvelled at it, but it made the present disaster all the more unbearable. All right, I said with false breeziness as I left. Maybe this one won't be so bad. Give me a ring in the morning. I did the rest of my round in a state of gloom, and at lunch I was still so preoccupied that I wondered what had happened when Tristan served the meal. I had entirely forgotten about Mrs Hall's absence. However, the sausage and mash wasn't at all bad, and Tristan was lavish with his helpings. The three of us cleaned our plates pretty thoroughly, because morning is the busiest working time in practice, and I was always famished by midday. My mind was still on Mr Billings' problem during the afternoon calls, and when we sat down to supper I was only mildly surprised to find another offering of sausage and mash. Same again, eh? Siegfried grunted, but he got through his plateful and left without further comment. The next day started badly. I came into the dining room to find the table bare and Siegfried stamping around. Where the hell is our breakfast? he burst out. And where the hell is Tristan? He pounded along the passage and I heard his shouts in the kitchen. Tristan! Tristan! I knew he was wasting his time. His brother often slept in, and it was just a bit more noticeable this morning. My boss returned along the passage at a furious gallop, and I steeled myself for some unpleasantness as the young man was rousted from his bed. But Tristan, as usual, was master of the situation. Siegfried had just begun to take the stairs three at a time when his brother descended from the landing, knotting his tie with perfect composure. It was uncanny. He always got more than his share of sleeping time, but he was rarely caught between the sheets. I'm sorry, chaps, he murmured. Afraid I overslept. Yes, that's all right, shouted Siegfried. But how about our bloody breakfast? I gave you a job to do. Tristan was contrite. I really do apologise, but I was up late last night peeling potatoes. His brother's face flushed. I know all about that. He barked. You didn't start till after closing time at the Drovers. Well, that's right. Tristan swallowed and his face assumed the familiar expression of pained dignity. I did feel a bit dry last night. Think it must have been all the cleaning and dusting I did. Siegfried did not reply. He shot a single exasperated look at the young man, then turned to me. We had to make do with bread and marmalade this morning, James. Come through to the kitchen and we'll... The jangling telephone cut off his words. I lifted the receiver and listened, and it must have been the expression on my face which stopped him in the doorway. What's the matter, James? he asked as I came away from the phone. You look as though you've had a kick in the belly. I nodded. Well, that's how I feel. That calf is nearly dead at Billings, and there's another one ill. I wish you'd come out there with me, Siegfried. My boss stood very still as he looked over the side of the pen at the little animal. It didn't seem to know where to put itself, rising and lying down, kicking at some inward pain, writhing its hindquarters from side to side. As he watched, it fell on its side and began to thrash around with all four limbs. James, he said quietly, that calf has been poisoned. Well, that's what I thought, but how? Mr Billings broke in. 
It's no good talking like that, Mr. Farnan. We've been over this place time and time again, and there's nothing for him to get. Well, we'll go over it again. Siegfried stalked around the calf house as I had done, and when he returned, his face was expressionless. Where do you get the nuts from? He grunted, crumbling one of the cubes between his fingers. Mr. Billings threw his arms wide. From local mill, ride is best. You can't fault them, surely. Siegfried said nothing. Riders were noted for their meticulous preparation of cattle food. He went over the sick calf with stethoscope and thermometer, digging his fingers into the hairy abdominal wall, staring impassively at the calf's face to note its reaction. He did the same with my patient of yesterday, whose glazing eyes and curled extremities told their grim tale. Then he gave the calves almost the same treatment as I had, and we left. He was silent for the first half mile, then he beat the wheel suddenly with one hand. There's an irritant poison there, James. As sure as God made little apples there is. But I'm damned if I know where it's coming from. Our visit had taken a long time, and we returned to Skeldale House for lunch. Like myself, his mind was still wrestling with Mr Billings' problem, and he hardly winced as Tristan placed a steaming plate full of sausage and mash before him. Then, as he prodded the mash with a fork, he appeared to come to the surface. God almighty! he exclaimed. Have we got this again? Tristan smiled ingratiatingly. Yes, indeed. Mr. Johnson told me they were a particularly fine batch of sausages today. Definitely superior, he said. Is that so? His brother gave him a sour glance. Well, they look the bloody same to me, like supper yesterday and like lunch. His voice began to rise, then he subsided. Ah, oh, what the hell, he muttered, and began to toy listlessly with the food. Clearly those calves had drained him, and I knew how he felt. I got through my share without much difficulty. I've always liked sausage and mash. But my boss is a resilient character, and when we met in the late afternoon, he was bursting with his old spirit. That call to Billings shook me, James, I can tell you, he said. But I've revisited a few of my other cases since then, and they're all improving nicely. Raises the morale tremendously. Here, let me get you a drink. He reached into the cupboard above the mantelpiece for the gin bottle, and after pouring a couple of measures, he looked benignly at his brother, who was tidying the sitting room. Tristan was making a big show, running a carpet sweeper up and down, straightening cushions, flicking a duster at everything inside. He sighed and panted with effort as he bustled around, the very picture of a harassed domestic. He needed only a mob cap and frilly apron to complete the image. We finished our drinks, and Siegfried immersed himself in the veterinary record as savoury smells began to issue from the kitchen. It was about seven o'clock when Tristan put his head round the door. Supper is on the table, he said. My boss put down the record, rose, and stretched expansively. God, I'm ready for it, too. I followed him into the dining room and almost cannoned into his back as he halted abruptly. He was staring in disbelief at the tureen in the middle of the table. Not bloody sausage and mash again, he bellowed. Tristan shuffled his feet. Well, um, yes. It's very nice, really. Very nice? I'm beginning to dream about that blasted stuff. Can't you cook anything else? Well, I told you. Tristan looked wounded. I told you I could cook sausage and mash. Yes, you did, shouted his brother. But you didn't say you couldn't cook anything else but sausage and bloody mash. Tristan made a non-committal gesture and his brother sank wearily down at the table. Go on, then, he sighed. Dish it out and heaven help us. He took a small mouthful from his plate, then gripped at his stomach and emitted a low moan. This stuff is killing me. I don't think I'll ever be the same after this week. The following day opened in dramatic fashion. I had just got out of bed and was reaching for my dressing gown when an explosion shook the house. It was a great woof which rushed like a mighty wind through passages and rooms, rattling the windows and leaving an ominous silence in its wake. I dashed out to the landing and ran into Siegfried, who stared wide-eyed at me for a moment before galloping downstairs. In the kitchen, Tristan was lying on his back amid a litter of pans and dishes, several rashers of bacon and a few smashed eggs nestled on the flags. What the hell's going on? Siegfried shouted. His brother looked up at him with mild interest. I really don't know. I was lighting the fire and there was a bang. 
Lighting the fire? Yes, I've had a little difficulty these last two mornings. The thing wouldn't go. I think the chimney needs sweeping. These old houses... Yes, yes! Siegfried burst out. We know, but what the hell happened? Tristan sat up. Even then, among the debris with smuts all over his face, he still retained his poise. Well, I thought I'd hurry things along a bit. His agile mind was forever seeking new methods of conserving energy. I soaked a piece of cotton wool in ether and chucked that in. Ether? Well, yes. It's inflammable, isn't it? Inflammable? His brother was pop-eyed. It's bloody well explosive. It's a wonder you didn't blow the whole place up. Tristan rose and dusted himself off. Oh, well. Never mind, I'll soon have breakfast ready. You can forget that. Siegfried took a long, shuddering breath, then went over to the bread tin, extracted a loaf, and began to saw at it. The breakfast's on the floor, and anyway, by the time you've cleared out this mess, we'll be gone. Bread and marmalade all right for you, James? We went out together again. My boss had arranged that Ken Billings should postpone his calf feeding till we got there so that we could witness the process. It wasn't a happy arrival. Both the calves had died, and the farmer's eyes held a look of desperation. Siegfried's jaw clenched tight for a moment, then he motioned with his hand. Please carry on, Mr Billings. I want to see you feed them. The nuts were always available for the little animals, but we watched intently as the farmer poured the milk into the buckets and the calves started to drink. The poor man had obviously given up hope, and I could tell by his apathetic manner that he hadn't much faith in this latest ploy. Well, neither had I. But Siegfried prowled up and down like a caged panther, as though willing something to happen. The calves raised white, slobbered muzzles inquiringly as he hung over them, but they could offer no more explanation of the mystery than I could myself. I looked across the long row of pens. There were still more than thirty calves left in the building, and the terrible thought arose that the disease might spread through all of them. My mind was recoiling when Siegfried stabbed a finger at one of the buckets. What's that? he snapped. The farmer and I went over and gazed down at a circular black object about half an inch across, floating on the surface of the milk. Bit of muck got in it somehow, Mr Billings mumbled. I'll have it out. He put his hand into the bucket. No, let me. Siegfried carefully lifted the thing, shook the milk from his fingers, and studied it with interest. This isn't muck, he murmured. Look, it's concave, like a little cup. He rubbed a corner between thumb and forefinger. I'll tell you what it is. It's a scab. Where the heck's it come from? He began to examine the neck and head of the calf, then became very still as he handled one of the little horn buds. There's a raw surface here. You can see where the scab belongs. He placed the dark cup over the bud, and it fitted perfectly. The farmer shrugged. Ah, oh, well, I can understand that. I just budded all the cows about a fortnight since. What did you use, Mr Billings? My colleague's voice was soft. Oh, some new stuff. Fella came round selling it. You just painted it on. It's a lot easier than town caustic stick. Have you got the bottle? Aye, it's in Taos. I'll get it. When the farmer returned, Siegfried read the label and handed the bottle to me. Butter of antimony, Jim. Now we know. But what are you on about? asked the farmer bewilderedly. Siegfried looked at him sympathetically. Antimony is a deadly poison, Mr Billings. Oh, it'll burn your hornbuds off all right, but if it gets in among the food, that's it. The farmer's eyes widened. Yes, dang it, that's when they put their heads down to drink, and that's just when the scabs would fall off. Exactly, Siegfried said. Or they maybe knock the hornbuds on the sides of the bucket. Anyway, let's make sure the others are safe. We went round all the calves, removing the lethal crusts and scrubbing the buds clean, and when we finally drove away, we knew that the brief but painful episode of the Billings calves was over. In the car, my colleague put his elbow on the wheel and drove with his chin cupped in his hands. He often did this when in contemplative mood, and it never failed to unnerve me. James, he said, I've never seen anything like that before. It really is one for the book. His words were prophetic, for as I write about it now, I realise that it has never been repeated in the thirty-five years that have passed since then. At Skeldale House we parted to go our different ways. 
Tristan, no doubt anxious to redeem himself after the morning's explosive beginning, was plying mop and bucket and swabbing the passage with the zeal of one of Nelson's sailors. But when Siegfried drove away, the activity stopped abruptly, and as I was leaving with my pockets stuffed with the equipment for my round, I glanced into the sitting room and saw the young man stretched in his favourite chair. I went in and looked with some surprise at a pan of sausages, balanced on the coals. What's this? I asked. Tristan lit a woodbine, shook out his daily mirror and put his feet up. Just prepared lunch, old lad. In here? Yes, Jim, I've had enough of that hot stove. There's no comfort through there. And anyway, the kitchen's such a bloody long way away. I gazed down at the reclining form. No need to ask what's on the menu. Not at all, old son. Tristan looked up from his paper with a seraphic smile. I was about to leave when a thought struck me. Where are the potatoes? In the fire. In the fire? Yes. I just popped them in there to roast for a while. They're delicious that way. Are you sure? Absolutely, Jim. I tell you, you'll fall in love with my cooking all over again. I didn't get back till nearly one o'clock. Tristan was not in the sitting room, but a haze of smoke hung on the air and a reek like a garden bonfire prickled in my nostrils. I found the young man in the kitchen. His savoir-faire had vanished and he was prodding desperately at a pile of coal-black spheres. I stared at him. What are those? The bloody potatoes, Jim. I fell asleep for a bit and this happened. He gingerly sawed through one of the objects. In the centre of the carbonaceous ball I could discern a small, whitish marble which seemed to be all that remained of the original vegetable. Hell's bells, Tris, what are you going to do? He gave me a stricken glance. Hack out the centres and mash them together. It's all I can do. This was something I couldn't bear to watch. I went upstairs, had a wash, then took my place at the dining table. Siegfried was already seated and I could see that the little triumph of the morning had cheered him. He greeted me jovially. James, wasn't that the damnedest thing at Ken Billings? So satisfying to get it cleared up. But his smile froze as Tristan appeared and set down the tureens before him. From one peeped the inevitable sausages, and the other contained an amorphous, dark grey mass, liberally speckled with black foreign bodies of varying size. What in the name of God? he inquired with ominous quiet. Is this? His brother swallowed. Sausages and mash, he said lightly. Siegfried gave him a cold look. I am referring to this. He poked warily at the dark mound. Well, ah, uh, it's the potatoes. Tristan cleared his throat. <coughs> Got a little burnt, I'm afraid. My boss made no comment. With dangerous calm, he spooned some of the material onto his plate, raised the forkful, and began to chew slowly. Once or twice he winced as a particularly tough fragment of carbon cracked between his molars, then he closed his eyes and swallowed. For a moment he was still, then he grasped his midriff with both hands, groaned, and jumped to his feet. No! That's enough! he cried. I don't mind investigating poisonings on the farm, but I object to being poisoned myself in my own home! He strode away from the table and paused at the door. I'm going over to the drovers for lunch. As he left, another spasm seized him. He clutched his stomach again and looked back. Now I know how those poor bloody calves felt. Chapter 7 I suppose it was a little thoughtless of me to allow my scalpel to flash and flicker quite so close to Rory O'Hagan's fly buttons. The incident came back to me as I sat in my room in St. John's Wood, reading Black's Veterinary Dictionary. It was a bulky volume to carry around, and my RAF friends used to rib me about my vest pocket edition, but I resolved to keep reading it in spare moments to remind me of my real life. I had reached the letter C, and as the word castration looked up at me from the page, I was jerked back to Rory. I was castrating pigs. 
There were several litters to do, and I was in a hurry and failed to notice the Irish farm workers mounting apprehension. His young boss was catching the little animals and handing them to Rory, who held them upside down, gripped between his thighs with their legs apart, and as I quickly incised the scrotums and drew out the testicles, my blade almost touched the rough material of his trouser crutch. For God's sake, have a care, Mr. Harriet, he gasped at last. I looked up from my work. What's wrong, Rory? Watch what you're doing with that bloody knife. You're whipping it round between my legs like a bloody red Indian. You'll do me a mischief before you're finished. Ah, oh, be careful, Mr. Harriet, the young farmer said. Don't geld Rory instead of the pig. His missus would never forgive you. He burst into a loud peal of laughter. The Irishman grinned sheepishly, and I giggled. That was my undoing, because the momentary inattention sent the blade slicing across my left forefinger. The razor-sharp edge went deep, and in an instant the entire neighbourhood seemed flooded with my blood. I thought I would never staunch the flow. The red ooze continued, despite a long session of self-doctrine from the car boot, and when I finally drove away, my finger was swathed in the biggest, clumsiest dressing I'd ever seen. I had finally been forced to apply a large pad of cotton wool held in place with an enormous length of three-inch bandage. It was dark when I left the farm. About five o'clock on a late December day, the light gone early and the stars beginning to show in a frosty sky. I drove slowly, the enormous finger jutting upwards from the wheel, pointing the way ahead between the headlights like a guiding beacon. I was within half a mile of Darabee, with the lights of the little town beginning to wink between the bare roadside branches. When a car approached, went past, then I heard a squeal of brakes as it stopped and began to double back. It passed me again, drew me into the side, and I saw a frantically waving arm. I pulled up, and a young man jumped from the driving seat and ran towards me. He pushed his head in at the window. Are you the vet? His voice was breathless, panic-stricken. Yes, I am. Oh, thank God. We're passing through on the way to Manchester, and we've been to your surgery. They said you were out this way, described your car. Please help us. What's the trouble? It's our dog. In the back of the car. He's got a ball stuck in his throat. I, I think he might be dead. I was out of my seat and running along the road before he had finished. It was a big white saloon, and in the darkness of the back seat, a wailing chorus issued from several little heads silhouetted against the glass. I tore open the door, and the wailing took on words. Oh, Benny, Benny, Benny! I dimly discerned a large dog spread over the knees of four small children. Oh, Daddy, he's dead, he's dead! Let's have him out, I gasped, and as the young man pulled on the forelegs, I supported the body which slid and toppled onto the tarmac with a horrible limpness. I pawed at the hairy form. I can't see a bloody thing. Help me pull him round. We dragged the unresisting bulk into the headlight's glare, and I could see it all. A huge, beautiful collie in his luxuriant prime, mouth gaping, tongue lolling, eyes staring lifelessly at nothing. He wasn't breathing. The young father took one look, then gripped his head with both hands. Oh, God, oh, God! From within the car, I could hear the quiet sobbing of his wife and the piercing cries from the back. Benny, Benny! I grabbed the man's shoulder and shouted at him. What did you say about the ball? It's in his throat. I've had my fingers in his mouth for ages, but I couldn't move it. The words came mumbling up from beneath the bent head. I pushed my hand into the mouth, and I could feel it all right. A sphere of hard, solid rubber, not much bigger than a golf ball, and jammed like a cork in the pharynx, effectively blocking the trachea. I scrabbled feverishly at the wet smoothness, but there was nothing to get hold of. It took me about three seconds to realise that no human agency would ever get the ball out that way, and, without thinking, I withdrew my hands, braced both thumbs behind the angle of the lower jaw, and pushed. The ball shot forth, bounced on the frosty road, and rolled sadly onto the grass verge. I touched the corneal surface of the eye. No reflex. I slumped to my knees, burdened by the hopeless regret that I hadn't had the chance to do this just a bit sooner. The only function I could perform now was to take the body back to Scaledale House for disposal. I couldn't allow the family to drive to Majesty with a dead dog. But I wished fervently that I'd been able to do more. And as I passed my hand along the richly coloured coat over the ribs, the vast bandaged finger stood out like a symbol of my helplessness. It was when I was gazing dully at the finger, the heel of my hand resting in an intercostal space, that I felt the faintest flutter from below.
I jerked upright with a hoarse cry. His heart's still beating. He's not gone yet. I began to work on the dog with all I had. Out there in the darkness of that lonely country road, it wasn't much. No stimulant injections, no oxygen cylinders, no intratracheal tubes. But I depressed his chest with my palms every three seconds in the old-fashioned way, willing the dog to breathe as the eyes still stared at nothing. Every now and then I blew desperately down the throat, or probed between the ribs for that almost imperceptible beat. I don't know which I noticed first, the slight twitch of an eyelid, or the small lift of the ribs which pulled the icy Yorkshire air into his lungs. Maybe they both happened at once, but from that moment everything was dreamlike and wonderful. I lost count of time as I sat there while the breathing became deep and regular, and the animal began to be aware of his surroundings. And by the time he started to look around him and twitch his tail tentatively, I realised suddenly that I was stiff-jointed and almost frozen to the spot. With some difficulty I got up and watched in disbelief as the collie staggered to his feet. The young father ushered him round to the back, where he was received with screams of delight. The man seemed stunned. Throughout the recovery he had kept muttering, You just flicked that ball out, just flicked it out. Why didn't I think of that? And when he turned to me before leaving, he appeared to be still in a state of shock. I don't... I don't know how to thank you, he said huskily. It's a miracle. He leant against the car for a second. And now, what is your fee? How much do I owe you? I rubbed my chin. I had used no drugs. The only expenditure had been time. Five bob, I said. And never let him play with such a little ball again. He handed the money over, shook my hand and drove away. His wife, who had never left her place, waved as she left, but my greatest reward was in the last shadowy glimpse of the back seat, where little arms twined around the dog, hugging him ecstatically, and in the cries, thankful and joyous, fading into the night. Benny! 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 Vets often wonder, after a patient's recovery, just how much credit they might take. Maybe it would have got better without treatment. It happens sometimes. It was difficult to be sure. But when you know without a shadow of doubt that, even without doing anything clever, you have pulled an animal back from the brink of death into the living, breathing world, it is a satisfaction which lingers, flowing like balm over the discomforts and frustrations of veterinary practice, making everything right. Yet, in the case of Benny, the whole thing had an unreal quality. I never even glimpsed the faces of those happy children nor that of their mother huddled in the front seat. I had a vague impression of their father, but he had spent most of the time with his head in his hands. I wouldn't have known him if I'd met him in the street. Even the dog in the unnatural glare of the headlights was a blurred memory. It seemed the family had the same feeling, because a week later I had a pleasant letter from the mother. She apologised for skulking out of the way so shamelessly as she thanked me for saving the life of their beloved dog, who was now prancing around with the children as though nothing had happened, and she finished with the regret that she hadn't even asked me my name. Yes, it had been a strange episode. And not only were those people unaware of my name, but I'd like to bet they would fail to recognise me if they saw me again. In fact, looking back at the affair, the only thing which stood out, unequivocal and substantial, was my great white-bound digit which had hovered constantly over the scene almost taking on a personality and significance of his own. I am sure that that is what the family remembered best about me, because of the way the mother's letter began. Dear Vet with the Bandaged Finger Chapter 8 My stint in London was nearing its end. Our breaking-in weeks were nearly over, and we waited for news of posting to initial training wing. The air was thick with rumours. We were going to Aberystwyth in Wales. Too far away for me. I wanted the north. Then we were going to Newquay in Cornwall, worse still. I was aware that the impending birth of AC2 Heriot's child did not influence the general war strategy, but I still wanted to be as near to Helen as possible at the time. The whole London phase is blurred in my memory. 
possibly because everything was so new and different that the impressions could not be fully absorbed, and also perhaps because I was tired most of the time. I think we were all tired. Few of us were used to being jerked from slumber at 6 a.m. every morning and spending the day in continual physical activity. If we weren't being drilled, we were being marched to meals, to classes, to talks. I had lived in a motor car for a few years, and the rediscovery of my legs was painful. There were times, too, when I wondered what it was all about. Like all the other young men, I had imagined that after a few brisk preliminaries, I would be sitting in an aeroplane learning to fly. But it turned out that this was so far in the future that it was hardly mentioned. At the ITW, we would spend months learning navigation, principles of flight, morse, and many other things. I was thankful for one blessing. I had passed the mathematics exam. I have always counted on my fingers and still do, and I have been so nervous about this that I went to classes with the ATC in Darabi before my call-up, dredging from my school days horrific calculations about trains passing each other at different speeds and water running in and out of bathtubs. But I had managed to scrape through and felt ready to face anything. There were some unexpected shocks in London. I didn't anticipate spending days mucking out some of the dirtiest piggeries I'd ever seen. Somebody must have had the idea of converting all the RAF waste food into pork and bacon, and of course, there was plenty of labour at hand. I had a strong feeling of unreality, as with other aspiring pilots, I threw muck and swill around hour after hour. My disenchantment was happily blotted from my mind the day we received news of the posting. It seemed too good to be true. I was going to Scarborough. I had been there and I knew it was a beautiful seaside resort, but that wasn't why I was so delighted. It was because it was in Yorkshire. As we marched out of the station into the streets of Scarborough, I could hardly believe I was back in my home county. But if there had been any doubt in my mind, it would have been immediately resolved by my first breath of the crisp, tangy air. Even in winter there had been no feel to the soft London air, and I half closed my eyes as I followed the tingle all the way down to my lungs. Mind you, it was cold. Yorkshire is a cold place, and I could remember the sensation, almost of shock, at the start of my first winter in Darby. It was after the first snow, and I followed the clanging ploughs up the dale, bumping along between high white mounds till I reached old Mr. Stokill's gate. With my fingers on the handle I looked through the glass at the new world beneath me. The white blanket rolled down the hillside and lapped over the roofs of the dwelling and outbuildings of the little farm. Beyond it smoothed out and concealed the familiar features, the stone walls bordering the fields, the stream on the valley floor turning the whole scene into something unknown and exciting. But the thrill I felt at the strange beauty was swept away as I got out and the wind struck me. It was an arctic blast screaming from the east, picking up extra degrees of cold as it drove over the frozen white surface. I was wearing a heavy overcoat and woolen gloves, but the gust whipped its way right into my bones. I gasped and leant my back against the car while I buttoned the coat up under my chin. Then I struggled forward to where the gate shook and rattled. I fought it open and my feet crunched as I went through. Coming round the corner of the byre, I found Mr. Stokehill forking muck onto a heap, making a churned brown trail across the whiteness. Now then, he muttered along the side of a half-smoked cigarette. He was over seventy, but still ran the small holding single-handed. He told me once that he had worked as a farmhand for six shillings a day for thirty years, yet still managed to save enough to buy his own little place. Maybe that was why he didn't want to share it. "'How are you, Mr. Stokehill?' I said. But just then the wind tore through the yard, clutching icily at my face, snatching my breath away so that I turned involuntary to one side with an explosive, "'Ah!' <gasps> The old farmer looked at me in surprise, then glanced around as though he had just noticed the weather. Aye, 
Blows a bit thin this morning, lad. Sparks flew from the end of his cigarette as he leant over for a moment on the fork. He didn't seem to have much protection against the cold. A light khaki smock fluttered over a ragged navy waistcoat, clearly once part of his best suit, and his shirt bore neither collar nor stud. The white stubble on his fleshless jaw was a reproach to my twenty-four years, and suddenly I felt an inadequate city-bred softy. The old man dug his fork into the manure pile and turned towards the buildings. I've got a nice few cases for you to see today. First un's in here. He opened the door and I staggered gratefully into a sweet bovine warmth where a few shaggy little bullocks stood hock deep in straw. That's the youth we want. He pointed to a dark roan standing with one hind foot knuckled over. He's been on three legs for a couple of days. I reckon he's got foul. I walked up to the little animal, but he took off at a speed which made light of his infirmity. We'll have to run him into the passage, Mr. Stokehill, I said. Just open the gate, will you? With the rough timbers pushed wide, I got behind the bullock and sent him on to the opening. It seemed as though he was going straight through, but at the entrance he stopped, peeped into the passage, and broke away. I galloped a few times round the yard after him, then had another go. The result was the same. After half a dozen tries, I wasn't cold any more. I'll back chasing young cattle against anything else for working up a sweat, and I had already forgotten the uncharitable world outside. And I could see I was going to get warmer still, because the bullock was beginning to enjoy the game, kicking up his heels and frisking around after each attempt. I put my hands on my hips, waited till I got my breath back, then turned to the farmer. This is hopeless. He'll never go in there, I said. We'd maybe better try to get a rope on him. Nay, lad, there's no need for that. We'll get him through gate right enough. The old man ambled to one end of the yard and returned with an armful of clean straw. He sprinkled it freely in the gate opening and beyond in the passage, then turned to me. Now, send him on. I poked a finger into the animal's rump, and he trotted forward, proceeded unhesitatingly between the posts and into the passage. Mr. Stokehill must have noticed my look of bewilderment. Aye, he just didn't like look of them cobbles. Once they was covered over, he was all right. Yes. Yes. I see. I followed the bullock slowly through. He was indeed suffering from foul of the foot, the medieval term given because of the stink of the necrotic tissue between the cleats, and I didn't have any antibiotics or sulfonamides to treat it. It is so nice and easy these days to give an injection, knowing that the beast will be sound in a day or two. But all I could do was wrestle with the lunging hind foot, dressing the infected cleft with a crude mixture of copper sulphate and Stockholm tar, and finishing with a pad of cotton wool held by a tight bandage. When I had finished, I took off my coat and hung it on a nail. I didn't need it any more. Mr. Stokehill looked approvingly at the finished job. Capital, capital, he murmured. Now there's some little pigs in this pen. Got a bit of scour. I want you to give them a jab with your needle. We had various E. coli vaccines, which sometimes did a bit of good in these cases, and I entered the pen hopefully. But I left in a hurry because the piglet's mother didn't approve of a stranger wandering among her brood, and she came at me open-mouthed, barking explosively. She looked as big as a donkey, and when the cavernous jaws with the great yellowed teeth brushed my thigh, I knew it was time to go. I hopped rapidly into the yard and crashed the door behind me. I peered back, ruminatively, into the pen. We'll have to get her out of there before I can do anything, Mr. Stokehill. Ah, you're right, young man. I'll shift her. He began to shuffle away. I held up a hand. No, it's all right. I'll do it. I couldn't let this frail old man go in there and maybe get knocked down and savaged, and I looked around for a means of protection. There was a battered shovel standing against the wall, and I seized it. Open the door, please, I said. I'll soon have her out. Once more inside the pen, I held the shovel in front of me and tried to usher the huge sow towards the door. 
but my efforts at poking her rear end were fruitless. She faced me all the time, wide-mouthed and growling as I circled. When she got the blade of the shovel between her teeth and began to worry it, I called a halt. As I left the pen, I saw Mr. Stokehill dragging a large object over the cobbles. What's that? I asked. Dustbin, the old man grunted in reply. Dustbin? What on earth? He gave no further explanation, but entered the pen. As the sow came at him, he allowed her to run her head into the bin. Then, bent double, he began to back her towards the open door. The animal was clearly baffled. Suddenly finding herself in this strange, dark place, she naturally tried to retreat from it, and all the farmer did was guide her. Before she knew what was happening, she was out in the yard. The old man calmly removed the bin and beckoned to me. Right you are, Mr. Harriet. You can get on now. It had taken about twenty seconds. Well, that was a relief, and anyway, I knew what to do next. Lifting a sheet of corrugated iron which the farmer had ready, I rushed in among the little pigs. I would pen them in a corner, and the job would be over in no time. But their mother's irritation had been communicated to the family. It was a big litter, and there were sixteen of them hurtling round like little pink racehorses. I spent a long time diving frantically after them, jamming the sheet at a bunch only to see half of them streaking out the other end and I might have gone on indefinitely had I not felt a gentle touch on my arm. Out on, young man, out on. The old farmer looked at me kindly. If you'll not but stop running after them, they'll settle down. Just bide a minute. Slightly breathless, I stood by his side and listened as he addressed the little creatures. Gis, 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 murmured Mr. Stokehill without moving. Gis, gis. Gis, gis. The piglets slowed their headlong gallop to a trot. Then, as though controlled by telepathy, they all stopped at once and stood in a pink group in one corner. Gis, gis, said Mr. Stokehill approvingly, advancing almost imperceptibly with the sheet. Gis, gis. He unhurriedly placed the length of metal across the corner and jammed his foot against the bottom. Now then... Put the two of you, Wellington, against the other end, and we have them, he said quietly. After that, the injection of the litter was a matter of a few minutes. Mr. Stokehill didn't say, Well, I'm teaching you a thing or two today, am I not? There was no hint of triumph or self-congratulation in the calm old eyes. All he said was, I'm keeping you busy this morning, young man. I want you to look at a cow now. She's got a pea in her tit. Peas and other obstructions in the teats were very common in the days of hand milking. Some of them were floating milk calculi, others tiny pedunculated tumours, injuries to the teat lining, all sorts of things. It was a whole diverting little field in itself, and I approached the cow with interest. But I didn't get very near before Mr. Stokehill put his hand on my shoulder. Just a minute, Mr. Harriet. Don't touch her tit yet or she'll clout you. She's an odd bitch. Wait a minute till I rope her. Oh, right, I said. But I'll do it. He hesitated. I reckon I ought to. No, no, Mr. Stoker, that's quite unnecessary. I know how to stop a cow kicking, I said primly. Kindly hand me that rope. But she's a bugger. Kicks like us. She's a right good milker, but don't worry, I said, smiling. I'll stop her little games. I began to unwind the rope. It was good to be able to demonstrate that I did know something about handling animals, even though I had been qualified for only a few months. And it made a change to be told before and not after the job that a cow was a kicker. A cow once kicked me nearly to the other end of the byre, and as I picked myself up, the farmer said unemotionally, Aye, she's Alice had a habit of that. Yes, it was nice to be warned. And I passed the rope round the animal's body in front of the udder and pulled it tight in a slipknot, just like they taught us at college. She was a scrawny red shorthorn with a woolly pole, and she regarded me with a contemplative eye as I bent down. All right, lass, I said soothingly, reaching under her and gently grasping the teat. I squirted a few jets of milk 
Then something blocked the end. Ah, yes. There it was, quite large and unattached. I felt sure I could work it through the orifice without cutting the sphincter. I took a firmer grip, squeezed tightly, and immediately a cloven foot shot out like a whiplash and smacked me solidly on the knee. It is a particularly painful spot to be kicked, and I spent some time hopping round the byre and cursing in a fervent whisper. The farmer followed me anxiously. Eh, I'm sorry, Miss Derry, she's a right, I'll bugger. Better let me... I held up a hand. No, Mr. Sturkill. I already have her roped. I just didn't tie it tight enough, that's all. I hobbled back to the animal, loosened the knot, then retied it, pulling till my eyes popped. When I had finished, her abdomen was lifted high and nipped in like a wasp-waisted Victorian lady of fashion. That'll fix you, I grunted, and bent to my work again. A few spurts of milk, then the thing was at the teat end again, a pinkish-white object peeping through the orifice. A little extra pressure, and I would be able to fish it out with the hypodermic needle I had poised ready. I took a breath and gripped hard. This time the hoof caught me halfway up the shinbone. She hadn't been able to get so much height into it, but it was just as painful. I sat down on a milk stool, rolled up my trouser leg and examined the roll of skin which hung like a diploma at the end of a long graze where the sharp hoof had dragged along. Now then, you've had enough, young man. Mr. Stokill removed my rope and gazed at me with commiseration. Ordinary methods don't work with this in. I have to milk her twice a day and I know. He fetched a soiled length of plough cord, which had obviously seen much service, and fastened it round the cow's hock. The other end had a hook, which he fitted into a ring on the byre wall. It was just the right length to stretch taut, pulling the leg slightly back. The old man nodded. Now try. With a feeling of fatalism, I grasped the teat again. And it was as if the cow knew she was beaten. She never moved as I nipped hard and winkled out the offending obstruction, a milk calculus. She couldn't do a thing about it. Ah, thank you, lad, the farmer said. That's champion. Been bothering me a bit as that. Didn't know what it was. He held up a finger. One last job for you. A young heifer with a bit of stomach trouble, I think. Saw her last night and she was a bit blown. She's in an outside building. I put on my coat and we went out to where the wind welcomed us with savage glee. As the knife-like blast hit me, whistling up my nose and making my eyes water, I cowered in the lee of the stable. Where is this heifer? I gasped. Mr. Stokehill did not reply immediately. He was lighting another cigarette, apparently oblivious of the elements. He clamped the lid on an ancient brass lighter and jerked his thumb. Across the road, up there. I followed his gesture over the buried walls, across the narrow roadway between the ploughed-out snow dunes, to where the fell rose steeply in a sweep of unbroken white to join the leaden sky. Unbroken, that is, except for a tiny barn, a grey stone speck just visible on the last airy swell, hundreds of feet up, where the hillside joined the moorland above. Sorry, I said, still crouching against the wall. I can't see anything. The old man, lounging in the teeth of the wind, looked at me in surprise. You can't? White right, barn's good enough to see, isn't it? The barn? I pointed a shaking finger at the heights. You mean that building? The heifer's surely not in there. Ah, she is. I keep a lot of my young beasts in them spots. But, but, I was gabbling now. We'll never get up there. That snow's three feet deep. He blew smoke pleasurably from his nostrils. We will. Don't thou worry. Just hang on a second. He disappeared into the stable, and after a few moments I peeped inside. He was saddling a fat brown cob, and I stared as he led the little animal out, climbed stiffly onto a box, and mounted. Looking down at me, he waved cheerfully. Well, let's be going. Have you got your stuff? Bewilderedly, I filled my pockets. A bottle of bloat mixture. Trocar and cannula. 
a packet of gentian and nux vomica. I did it in the dull knowledge that there was no way I could get up that hill. On the other side of the road, an opening had been dug and Mr. Stokehill rode through. I slithered in his wake, looking up hopelessly at the great smooth wilderness rearing above us. Mr. Stokehill turned in the saddle. Get out on tail, he said. I beg your pardon? Get a howd of his tail. As in a dream, I seized the bristly hairs. No, both hands, the farmer said patiently. Well, like this? That's grand, lad. Now hang on. He clicked his tongue, the cob plodded resolutely forward, and so did I. And it was easy. The whole world fell away beneath us as we soared upwards. And leaning back and enjoying it, I watched the little valley unfold along its twisting length, until I could see away into the main dale with the great hills billowing round and white into the dark clouds. At the barn, the farmer dismounted. All right, young man. All right, Mr. Stokehill. As I followed him into the little building, I smiled to myself. This old man had once told me that he had left school when he was twelve, whereas I had spent most of the twenty-four years of my life in study. Yet, when I looked back on the last hour or so, I could come to only one conclusion. I'd had more of books, but he had more of learning. Chapter 9 I had plenty of company for Christmas that year. We were billeted in the Grand Hotel, the massive Victorian pile which dominated Scarborough in turreted splendour from its eminence above the sea, and the big dining room was packed with several hundred shouting airmen. The iron discipline was relaxed for a few hours to let the Yuletide spirit run free. It was so different from other Christmases I had known, that it ought to have remained like a beacon in my mind. But I know that my strongest memory of Christmas will always be bound up with a certain little cat. I first saw her when I was called to see one of Mrs Ainsworth's dogs, and I looked in some surprise at the furry black creature sitting before the fire. I didn't know you had a cat, I said. The lady smiled. We haven't. This is Debbie. Debbie? Yes, at least that's what we call her. She's a stray. Comes here two or three times a week and we give her some food. I don't know where she lives, but I believe she spends a lot of her time around one of the farms along the road. Do you ever get the feeling that she wants to stay with you? No, Mrs Ainsworth shook her head. She's a timid little thing, just creeps in, has some food, then flits away. There's something so appealing about her, but she doesn't seem to want to let me or anybody into her life. I looked again at the little cat. But she isn't just having food today. That's right, it's a funny thing, but every now and again she slips through here into the lounge and sits by the fire for a few minutes. It's as though she was giving herself a treat. Yes, I see what you mean. There was no doubt there was something unusual in the attitude of the little animal. She was sitting bolt upright on the thick rug which lay before the fireplace in which the coals glowed and flamed. She made no effort to curl up or wash herself or do anything other than gaze quietly ahead and there was something in the dusty black of her coat, the half-wild, scrawny look of her, that gave me a clue. This was a special event in her life, a rare and wonderful thing. She was lapping up a comfort undreamt of in her daily existence. As I watched, she turned, crept soundlessly from the room, and was gone. That's always the way with Debbie, Mrs Ainsworth laughed. She never stays more than ten minutes or so, and then she's off. She was a plumpish, pleasant-faced woman in her forties, and the kind of client veterinary surgeons dream of. Well off, generous, and the owner of three cosseted basset hounds. And it only needed the habitually mournful expressions of one of the dogs to deepen a little, and I was round there post-haste. Today, one of the bassets had raised its paw and scratched its ear a couple of times, and that was enough to send its mistress scurrying to the phone in great alarm. So my visits to the Ainsworth home were frequent but undemanding, and I had ample opportunity to look out for the little cat, which had intrigued me. On one occasion I spotted her nibbling daintily from a saucer at the kitchen door. 
As I watched, she turned and almost floated on light footsteps into the hall, then through the lounge door. The three Bassets were already in residence, draped snoring on the fireside rug, but they seemed to be used to Debbie because two of them sniffed her in a bored manner and the third merely cocked a sleepy eye at her before flopping back on the rich pile. Debbie sat among them in her usual posture, upright, intent, gazing absorbedly into the glowing coals. This time I tried to make friends with her. I approached her carefully, but she leant away as I stretched out my hand. However, by patient wheedling and soft talk, I managed to touch her and gently stroked her cheek with one finger. There was a moment when she responded by putting her head on one side and rubbing back against my hand, but soon she was ready to leave. Once outside the house, she darted quickly along the road and then through a gap in her hedge, and the last I saw was the little black figure flitting over the rain-swept grass of a field. I wonder where she goes, I murmured half to myself. Mrs. Ainsworth appeared at my elbow. That's something we've never been able to find out. It must have been nearly three months before I heard from Mrs. Ainsworth, and in fact I had begun to wonder at the Bassett's long, symptomless run when she came on the phone. It was Christmas morning, and she was apologetic. Miss Derriott, I'm so sorry to bother you today of all days. I should think you want to rest at Christmas like anybody else. But her natural politeness could not hide the distress in her voice. Please don't worry about that, I said. Which one is it this time? It's not one of the dogs. It's, um, Debbie. Debbie? Is she at your house now? Yes, but, but there's something wrong. Please come quickly. Driving through the marketplace, I thought again that Dallaby on Christmas Day was like Dickens come to life. The empty square with the snow thick on the cobbles and hanging from the eaves with the fretted lines of roofs. The shops closed and the coloured lights of the Christmas trees winking at the windows of the clustering houses, warmly inviting against the cold white bulk of the fells behind. Mrs Ainsworth's home was lavishly decorated with tinsel and holly, rows of drinks stood on the sideboard and the rich aroma of turkey and sage and onion stuffing wafted from the kitchen. But her eyes were full of pain as she led me through to the lounge. Debbie was there all right, but this time everything was different. She wasn't sitting upright in her usual position. She was stretched quite motionless on her side, and huddled close to her lay a tiny black kitten. I looked down in bewilderment. What's happened here? It's the strangest thing, Mrs Ainsworth replied. I haven't seen it for several weeks, then she came in about two hours ago, sort of staggered into the kitchen, and she was carrying the kitten in her mouth. She took it through to the lounge and laid it on the rug, and at first I was amused but I could see all was not well because she sat as she usually does, but for a long time, over half an hour. Then she lay down like this and she hasn't moved. I knelt on the rug and passed my hand over Debbie's neck and ribs. She was thinner than ever, her fur dirty and mud-caked. She did not resist as I gently opened her mouth. The tongue and mucous membranes were abnormally pale and the lips ice-cold against my fingers. When I pulled down her eyelid and saw the dead white conjunctiva, a knell sounded in my mind. I palpated the abdomen with a grim certainty as to what I would find. And there was no surprise, only a dull sadness as my fingers closed round the hard, lobulated mass deep among the viscera. Massive lymphosarcoma. Terminal and hopeless. I put my stethoscope on her heart and listened to the increasingly faint, rapid beat. Then I straightened up and sat on the rug, looking sightlessly into the fireplace, feeling the warmth of the flames on my face. Mrs Ainsworth's voice seemed to come from afar. Is she ill, Miss Harriet? I hesitated. Yes. Yes, I'm afraid so. She has a malignant growth. I stood up. There's absolutely nothing I can do. I'm sorry. Oh! Her hand went to her mouth and she looked at me wide-eyed. When at last she spoke, her voice trembled. Well, you must put her to sleep immediately. It's the only thing to do. We can't let her suffer. Mrs Ainsworth, I said, there's no need. She's dying now in a coma, far beyond suffering. She turned quickly away from me and was very still as she fought with her emotions. 
Then she gave up the struggle and dropped on her knees beside Debbie. Oh, poor little thing, she sobbed, and stroked the cat's head again and again as the tears fell unchecked on the matted fur. What she must have come through. I feel I ought to have done more for her. For a few moments I was silent, feeling her sorrow so discordant among the bright seasonal colours of this festive room. Then I spoke gently. Nobody could have done more than you, I said. Nobody could have been kinder. But I'd have kept her here, in comfort. It must have been terrible out there in the cold when she was so desperately ill. I don't think about it. And having kittens too, I... I wonder how many she did have. I shrugged. I don't suppose we'll ever know. Maybe just this one. It happens sometimes. And she brought it to you, didn't she? Yes, that's right, she did. She did. Mrs. Ainsworth reached out and lifted the bedraggled black morsel. She smoothed her fingers along the muddy fur and the tiny mouth opened in a soundless meow. Is this strange? She was dying and she brought her kitten here. And on Christmas Day. I bent and put my hand on Debbie's heart. There was no beat. I looked up. I'm afraid she's gone. I lifted the small body almost feather light wrapped it in the sheet which had been spread on the rug, and took it out to the car. When I came back, Mrs. Ainsworth was still stroking the kitten. The tears had dried on her cheeks, and she was bright-eyed as she looked at me. I've never had a cat before, she said. I smiled. Well, it looks as though you've got one now. And she certainly had. That kitten grew rapidly into a sleek, handsome cat with a boisterous nature which earned him the name of Buster. In every way, he was the opposite to his timid little mother. Not for him the privations of a secret outdoor life. He stalked the rich carpets of the Ainsworth home like a king, and the ornate collar he always wore added something more to his presence. On my visits, I watched his development with delight, but the occasion which stays in my mind was the following Christmas Day, a year from his arrival. I was out of my rounds as usual. I, I can't remember when I haven't had to work on Christmas Day because the animals have never got round to recognising it as a holiday. But with the passage of the years, the vague resentment I used to feel has been replaced by philosophical acceptance. After all, as I tramped round the hillside barns and the frosty air, I was working up a better appetite for my turkey than all the millions lying in bed or slumped by the fire. And this was aided by the innumerable aperitifs I received from the hospitable farmers. I was on my way home, bathed in a rosy glow. I had consumed several whiskies, the kind the inexpert Yorkshireman pour as though it was ginger ale, and I had finished with a glass of old Mrs. Earnshaw's rhubarb wine, which had seared its way straight to my toenails. I heard the cry as I was passing Mrs. Ainsworth's house. Merry Christmas, Mr. Harriet! She was letting a visitor out of the front door, and she waved at me gaily. Come in and have a drink to warm you up. I didn't need warming up, but I pulled into the curb without hesitation. In the house there was all the festive cheer of last year, and the same glorious whiff of sage and onion which set my gastric juices surging. But there was not the sorrow. There was Buster. He was darting up to each of the dogs in turn, ears pricked, eyes blazing with devilment, dabbing a paw at them, then streaking away. Mrs. Ainsworth laughed. You know, he plagues the life out of them, gives them no peace. She was right. To the Bassets, Buster's arrival was rather like the intrusion of an irreverent outsider into an exclusive London club. For a long time they had led a life of measured grace, regular sedate walks with their mistress, superb food in ample quantities and long snoring sessions on the rugs and armchairs. Their days followed one upon another in unruffled calm. And then came Buster. He was dancing up to the youngest dog again, sideways this time, head on one side, goading him. When he started boxing with both paws, it was too much even for the Basset. He dropped his dignity and rolled over with the cat in a brief wrestling match. I want to show you something. 
Mrs. Ainsworth lifted a hard rubber ball from the sideboard and went out to the garden, followed by Buster. She threw the ball across the lawn, and the cat bounded after it over the frosted grass, the muscles rippling under the black sheen of his coat. He seized the ball in his teeth, brought it back to his mistress, dropped it at her feet, and waited expectantly. She threw it, and he brought it back again. I gasped incredulously. A feline retriever. The Bassets looked on disdainfully. Nothing would have induced them to chase a ball, but Buster did it again and again as though he would never tire of it. Mrs. Ainsworth turned to me. Have you ever seen anything like that? No, I replied, I never have. He is a most remarkable cat. She snatched Buster from his play and we went back into the house where she held him close to her face, laughing as the big cat purred and arched himself ecstatically against her cheek. Looking at him, a picture of health and contentment, my mind went back to his mother. Was it too much to think that that dying little creature with the last of her strength had carried her kitten to the only haven of comfort and warmth she had ever known, in the hope that it would be cared for there? Maybe it was. But it seemed I wasn't the only one with such fancies. Mrs. Ainsworth turned to me, and though she was smiling, her eyes were wistful. Debbie would be pleased, she said. I nodded. Yes, she would. It was just a year ago today she brought him, wasn't it? That's right. She hugged Buster to her again. Chapter 10 I stared in disbelief at the dial of the weighing machine. Nine stone, seven pounds. I had lost two stones since joining the RAF. I was cowering in my usual corner in Boots' chemist shop in Scarborough, where I had developed the habit of a weekly weigh-in to keep a morbid eye on my progressive emaciation. It was incredible, and it wasn't all due to the tough training. On our arrival in Scarborough, we had a talk from our flight commander, Flight Lieutenant Barnes. He looked us over with a contemplative eye and said, You won't know yourselves when you leave here. That man wasn't kidding. We were never at rest. It was PT and drill, PT and drill, over and over. Hours of bending and stretching and twisting down on the prom in singlets and shorts while the wind whipped over us from the wintry sea. Hours of marching under the bellowings of our sergeant. Quick march, slow march, about turn. We even marched to our navigation classes, bustling along at the quick time, arms swinging shoulder high. They marched us regularly to the top of Castle Hill, where we fired off every conceivable type of weapon. Twelve bores, point two two rifles, revolvers, browning machine guns. We even stabbed at dummies with bayonets. In between, they had us swimming, playing football or rugby, or running for miles along the beach and on the cliff tops towards Filey. At first, I was too busy to see any change in myself, but one morning, after a few weeks, our flight was coming to the end of a five-mile run. We dropped down from the spa to a long stretch of empty beach, and the sergeant shouted, Right, sprint to those rocks, let's see who gets there first. We all took off on the last hundred yards dash, and I was mildly surprised to find that the first man past the post was myself. And I wasn't really out of breath. That was when the realisation hit me. Mr. Barnes had been right. I didn't know myself. When I left Helen, I was a cosseted young husband with a little double chin and the beginnings of a spare tyre, and now I was a lithe, tireless greyhound. I was certainly fit, but there was something wrong. I shouldn't have been as thin as this. Another factor was at work. In Yorkshire, when a man goes into a decline during his wife's pregnancy, they giggle behind their hands and say, he is carrying the baby. I never laugh at these remarks because I am convinced I carried my son. I base this conclusion on a variety of symptoms. It would be an exaggeration to say I suffered from morning sickness, but my suspicions were certainly aroused when I began to feel a little queasy in the early part of the day. This was followed by a growing uneasiness as Helen's time drew near, and a sensation, despite my physical condition, of being drained and miserable. With the onset in the later stages of unmistakable labour pains in my lower abdomen, all doubts were resolved, and I knew I had to do something about it. I had to see Helen. 
After all, she was just over that hill which I could see from the top windows of the ground. Maybe that wasn't strictly true, but at least I was in Yorkshire and a bus would take me to her in three hours. The snag was that there was no leave from ITW. They left us in no doubt about that. They said the discipline was as tough as a guard's regiment and the restrictions just as rigid. I would get compassionate leave when the baby was born, but I couldn't wait till then. The grim knowledge that any attempt to dodge off unofficially would be like a minor desertion and would be followed by serious consequences, even prison, didn't weigh with me. As one of my comrades put it, one bloke tried it and finished up in the glass house. It isn't worth it, mate. But it was no good. I am normally a law-abiding citizen, but I had not a single scruple. I had to see Helen. A surreptitious study of the timetables revealed that there was a bus at 2pm which got to Darabee at 5 o'clock, and another leaving Darabee at 6, which arrived in Scarborough at 9. Six hours travelling to have one hour with Helen. It was worth it. At first I couldn't see a way of getting to the bus station at 2 o'clock in the afternoon because we were never free at that time, but my chance came quite unexpectedly. One Friday lunchtime we learnt that there were no more classes that day, but we were confined to the grand till evening. Most of my friends collapsed thankfully onto their beds, but I slunk down the long flights of stone stairs and took up a position in the foyer where I could watch the front door. There was a glass-fronted office on one side of the entrance where the SPs sat and kept an eye on all departures. There was only one on duty today, and I waited till he turned and moved to the back of the room, then I walked quietly past him and out into the square. That part had been almost too easy, but I felt naked and exposed as I crossed the deserted space between the Grand and the hotels on the opposite side. It was better once I had rounded the corner and I set off at a brisk pace for the west. All I needed was a little bit of luck, and as I pressed dry-mouthed along the empty street, it seemed I had found it. The shock when I saw the two burly SPs strolling towards me was like a blow, but was immediately followed by a strange calm. They would ask me for the pass I didn't have. Then they would want to know what I was doing there. It wouldn't be much good telling them I'd just popped out for a breath of air. This street led to both the bus and railway stations, and it wouldn't need a genius to tumble my little game. Anyway, there was no cover here, no escape, and I wondered idly if there had ever been a veterinary surgeon in the glasshouse. Maybe I was about to set up some kind of record. Then behind me I heard the rhythmic tramp of marching feet and the shrill, If right, if right, that usually went with it. I turned and saw a long blue column approaching with a corporal in charge. As they swung past me I looked again at the SPs and my heart gave a thud. They were laughing into each other's faces at some private joke. They hadn't seen me. Without thinking I tagged on to the end of the marching men and within a few seconds was past the SPs unnoticed. With my mind working with the speed of desperation, it seemed I would be safest where I was till I could break away in the direction of the bus station. For a while I had a glorious feeling of anonymity. Then the corporal, still shouting, glanced back. He faced to the front again, then turned back more slowly for another look. He appeared to find something interesting because he shortened his stride till he was marching opposite me. As he looked me up and down, I examined him in turn from the corner of my eye. He was a shriveled, runtish creature with fierce little eyes glinting from a pallid, skull-like face. It was some time before he spoke. "'Who the hell are you?' he inquired conversationally. It was the number one awkward question, but I discerned the faintest gleam of hope. He had spoken in the unmistakable, harsh, glottal accent of my hometown. "'Harriet Corporal, T-Flight Four Squadron.' I replied in my broadest Glasgow. T fight fl This is one fight three squadron. What the hell are you doing here? Arms swinging high, staring rigidly ahead, I took a deep breath. Concealment was futile now. Trying to get to see my wife, Cobb. She's having a baby soon. I glanced quickly at him. His was not the kind of face to reveal weakness by showing surprise, but his eyes widened fractionally. Get to see your wife? Are you... you daft or what? It's not far, Cobb. She lives in Darby. Three hours on the bus. I'd be back by tonight. Back tonight? You wait, you... Head examined. I've got to go. I fuck! 
he screamed suddenly at the men before us. If ain't, if ain't, and he turned and studied me as though I were an unbelievable phenomenon. He was interesting to me, too, as a typical product of the bad times in Glasgow between the wars. Stunted, undernourished, but as tough and belligerent as a ferret. Do you know, Ken, he said at length, that you get leave when your wife has the ween? Hey, but I can't wait that long. Give me a break, Cobb. Give you a break? Do you want to get me shot? No, Cobb, I just want to get to the bus station. Jesus, is that it? He gave me a final, incredulous look before quickening his steps to the head of the column. When he returned, he surveyed me again. We'd better Glasgow, you friend. Scotch down here, I replied. How about you? Go on. I turned my head slightly towards him. Rangers as Porter, eh? He did not change expression, but an eyebrow flickered and I knew I had him. What a team, I murmured reverently. Many's the time I've stood on the terraces at Ibrox. He said nothing, and I began to recite the names of the great Rangers team of the thirties. Dawson, Gray, MacDonald, Micklejohn, Simpsons, Brown. His eyes took on a dreamy expression, and by the time I had intoned Archibald, Marshall, English, MacPhail, and Morton, there was something near to a wistful smile on his lips. Then he appeared to shake himself back to normality. It right, it right, he bawled. Come on, come on, pick it up. Then he muttered to me from the corner of his mouth. There's the bus station. When we march past it, run light. He took off again, shouting to the head of the flight. I saw the buses and the windows of the waiting room on my left and dived across the road and through the door. I snatched off my cap and sat trembling among a group of elderly farmers and their wives. Through the glass I could see the long lines of blue moving away down the street and I could still hear the shouts of the corporal. But he didn't turn round and I saw only his receding back. The narrow shoulders squared, the bent legs stepping it out in time with his men. I never saw him again. But to this day I wish I could take him to Ibrox and watch the rangers with him and maybe buy him a half and half pint at one of the Govan pubs. It wouldn't have mattered if he had turned out to be a Celtic supporter at that decisive moment because I had the Celtic team on my tongue all ready to trot out, starting with Kennaway, Cook, McGonagall. It is not the only time my profound knowledge of football has stood me in good stead. Sitting on the bus, still with my cap on my lap to avoid attracting attention, it struck me that the whole world changed within a mile or two as we left the town. Back there, the war was everywhere, filling people's minds and eyes and thoughts, the teeming thousands of uniformed men, the RAF and army vehicles, the almost palpable atmosphere of anticipation and suspense. And suddenly it all just stopped. It vanished as the wide sweep of grey-blue sea fell beneath the rising ground behind the town, and as the bus trundled westward. I looked out on a landscape of untroubled peace. The long, moist furrows of the new-turned soil glittered under the pale February sun, contrasting with the gold stubble fields and the grassy pastures where sheep clustered around their feeding troughs. There was no wind, and the smoke rose straight from the farm chimneys, and the bare branches of the roadside trees were still as they stretched across the cold sky. There were many things that pulled at me, a man in breeches and leggings carrying on his shoulder a bale of hay to some outlying cattle, a group of farm men burning hedge clippings and the fragrance of the wood smoke finding its way into the bus. The pull was stronger as the hours passed and the beginnings of my own familiar countryside began to appear beyond the windows. Maybe it was a good thing I didn't see Darabee. Helen's home was near the bus route and I dropped off well short of the town. She was alone in the house and she turned her head as I walked into the kitchen. The delight on her face was mixed with astonishment. In fact, I know we were both astonished, she because I was so skinny and I because she was so fat. Helen, with the baby only two weeks away, was very large indeed, but not too large for me to get my arms around her, and we stood there in the middle of the flagged floor, clasped together for a long time with neither of us saying much. She cooked me egg and chips and sat by me while I ate. 
We carried on a rather halting conversation, and it came to me with a bump that my mind had been forced onto different tracks since I'd left her. In those few months, my brain had become saturated with the things of my new life. Even my mouth was full of RAF slang and jargon. In our bed-sitter, we used to talk about my cases, the funny things that happened on my rounds, but now I thought helplessly there wasn't much point in telling her that AC2 Phillips was on jankers again, that vector triangles were the very devil, that Don McGregor thought he had discovered the secret of Sergeant Hines' phenomenally shiny boots. But it really didn't matter. My worries melted as I looked at her. I had been wondering if she was well, and there she was, bouncing with energy, shiny-eyed, rosy-cheeked and beautiful. There was only one jarring note, and it was a strange one. Helen was wearing a maternity dress, which expanded with the passage of time by means of an opening down one side. Anyway, I hated it. It was blue with a high red collar, and I thought it cheap-looking and ugly. I was aware that austerity had taken over in England and that a lot of things were shoddy, but I desperately wished my wife had something better to wear. In all my life, there have been very few occasions when I badly wanted more money, and that was one of them, because on my wage of three shillings a day as an AC2, I was unable to drape her with expensive clothes. The hour winged past, and it seemed no time at all before I was back on the top road waiting in the gathering darkness for the Scarborough bus. The journey back was a bit dreary as the blacked-out vehicle bumped and rattled its way through the darkened villages and over the long stretches of anonymous countryside. It was cold, too, but I sat there happily with the memory of Helen wrapped around me like a warm quilt. The whole day had been a triumph. I had got away by a lucky stroke and there would be no problem getting back into the ground because one of my pals would be on sentry duty and it would be a case of pass friend. Closing my eyes in the gloom, I could still feel Helen in my arms, and I smiled to myself at the memory of her bounding healthiness. She looked marvellous. The egg and chips tasted wonderful. Everything was great. Except that one discord which jangled still. Oh, how I hated that dress. Thank you for listening to our audiobooks. We do our best to regularly upload quality books with clear narrations. Please subscribe to our channel and click the notification bell icon so we can bring you more great books. Thank you very much and we hope you enjoyed listening to your audiobook.